So if I could get everyone's attention, um, we're going to start the meeting. Um, we're going to start with the executive director's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have some uh, reminders for the public and for the board. First, I want to remind folks to sign in if you haven't already up at the front table outside. Um, I also wanted to update the board and the public on several meetings that um, the board staff and members of the board are part of in, in different um, uh, meetings that we've been having. First is the Remount Fair Board Data Governance Council, which is a um, council that was created by the board a, a few years ago to govern the VCURES data set as well as the VUDS data set. And we had a meeting on Monday to review a request for data um, for my medical shopper. And that uh, request was denied, um, but we anticipate that they will be coming back to um, request another, um, to request the data again. We are in the process of updating our um, application as well as our policies and principles. So we do feel that um, in the future they, they may be interested in coming back to apply for the data. In addition, a, another meeting that we're having is this evening, uh, the Primary Care Advisory Group. This is also, um, this was a, a group that was actually uh, created by the legislature two years ago. And um, the initial group was uh, per, we started per Act uh, 113 of 2016. And the legislature asked us to organize this group to address administrative burdens that primary care providers are feeling are, are, are feeling in their practice. So this is um, very li related to what we're going to be talking about today. That group, per the legislature, sunsetted in June of this year. So the chair, uh, because we do not have a, a healthcare provider on the board currently, asked that we continue the group as a technical advisory group. So we will have our inaugural primary care advisory group 2.0 this evening from 5 to 7 at the Green Mountain Care Board offices on State Street. The other announcements I have is two um, upcoming board meetings. One is on October 10th. We will be having our general advisory meeting here in this room. And then lastly, on October 31st, the board will be going on the road. We'll be headed down to the Upper Valley, to Mattiscutney Hospital, and uh, we'll be having our board meeting from 1 to 4 that afternoon uh, at the Mattiscutney campus. And if there's any questions about locations, times of any of these meetings, days, all of this information is on our website. And that's all I have to report. Any questions? Thank you, Susan. Um, just one other calendar addition on September 27th. Um, Member Pelham and I will be attending an, an all-day um, summit on workforce issues in healthcare at Castleton University. Um, with that, um, the next item is the minutes of Tuesday, September 11th and Wednesday, September 12th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved to approve the minutes of September 11th and September 12th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? So um, I'm going to turn the uh, mic over to board member Jessica Holmes in a second, but just to say that um, this is a, a topic that has no easy solutions, um, but it's one that we're hopeful can be resolved in a manner that um, encourages people to want to uh, practice in Vermont and encourages um, providers to want to participate in the ACO and the all-payer model. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jess. Great. Thank you very much. And I want to thank all of you for coming. I know this is a very large panel. And uh, the topic is 
is, is complicated and we wanted to get as many of the voices in the room as we possibly could and so I think we have a, a fantastic panel up here. I wanted to set the stage a little bit about why the Green Mountain Care Board might be looking at this topic of administrative burden. Um, I went back and looked at Act 48 and in the discussion of the purpose of the Green Mountain Care Board, the language specifically states that the board should promote the general good of the state by improving the health of the population, reducing the per capita rate of growth and expenditures for health services in Vermont across all payers while ensuring that access to care and quality of care are not compromised, enhancing the patient and healthcare professional experience of care, recruiting and retaining high quality healthcare professionals, and this is perhaps the most important one here, and achieving administrative simplification in healthcare financing and delivery. So it's part of our, our role as uh, healthcare regulators to be thinking about these things. And about a year ago, uh, we did a uh, clinician landscape study, and we surveyed about 400 Vermont clinicians to find out basically many different kinds of questions. What were their sources of frustration, satisfaction, what were threats to their practice? And across the board, no matter the employment type or the area of specialization, whether it was primary care or specialty care, whether they were independently employed or whether they were hospital employed, paperwork, billing, administrative, regulatory burden were among the top you know, uh, frustrations and threats to practice. So with that in mind, we felt like we had to at least have start having some conversations with that. I will like to say that Vermont is not alone in this. This is a national trend, administrative burden, you know, paperwork uh, is frustrating to clinicians all over the country. Um, but subsequent conversations with Vermont providers in focus groups and in health first meetings that I've attended and other venues that we've heard through our provider networks that we, we chat with, um, administrative, as that administrative burden is growing, morale to some extent may be shrinking and we, the worry would be that are we going to have issues and more challenges with recruitment and retention, which we just came through our hospital budget hearings and heard a lot about recruitment and retention. So these are issues that are paramount to us as a board and to all Vermonters. Uh, we also, through our rate review hearings, in contrast, heard from insurers that there are some administrative tasks, such as utilization reviews and prior authorizations, which I know we're going to hear a lot about, that they have some value um, to the insurers. They can be effective cost-minimizing strategies to, to some extent, and they're used as a tool to reduce fraud and overutilization and other potential waste in the system, and that such uh, tools, some of these tools can actually keep premiums lower for consumers. And so we hear that as well. We also are hearing as we move to value-based payment, the realization that we have to quantify health outcomes, right? If we want to move to value-based payment, we have to be able to quantify value. And so that requires quality measurement, another administrative task for providers. So there's a lot of competing forces at play, and I feel like we have lots of different voices here at the table. And I think we ha the goal, at least for me personally, I don't want to speak to, the, to everybody here, but can we think about are there administrative tasks that are cost effective, maybe those stay, and are there administrative tasks that are imposing undue burden, that are not efficient, that are not providing value added, that maybe we can think about eliminating to the extent that it's going to improve morale, improve retention, recruitment, and satisfaction of providers in our state. So we need to have a strong, satisfied network of providers. How can we do that? So with that, all of that in mind, Vermont has always been a leading edge innovator. I believe that. So how can we identify ways to reduce administrative burden without increasing costs and compromising patient health or safety? So I want to welcome all of you today in the hopes that we can come to some path forward. We can think about ways in which we can reduce some of the burden um, at the same time be you know focusing on bending that cost curve and improving quality outcomes for patients in Vermont. So I'm going to introduce the, the panelists today. We have Dr. Mark Peluso, who is the medical director at Middlebury College. And we have Dr. Faye Holman, who is a family practitioner at Little Rivers Healthcare. We have Rick Dooley, who is at Health First and also a PA. We have Dr. Uliger, who is at UVM Health Network, um, and in particular is the VP of Clinical Operations. Associate VP of Clinical Operations. We have Michael Costa, who is the Deputy Commissioner at DIVA. And we have Dr. Norm Ward, who is the Chief Medical Officer at uh, OneCare. And we have Dr. Peras, who is the CEO and CMO at Mount Escutney. 
and we have Dr. Kimberly Kilby, who is the Vermont Medical Director at MVP, and we have Dr. Josh Clavin, who is the VP and CMO at Blue Cross Blue Shield. So we have providers represented, we have admi hospital administrators, we have insurers, we have OneCare, we have Diva. I feel like we got it all here. We should be able to figure this out, right? That is my goal. Can we figure this out? Everybody's here. Everybody's literally at the table. Not everybody, but a lot of people. So with that, I thought I would kick it off with Dr. Peluso. Um, and I know you have some slides, so how about it? Thank you. Just, uh, can you guys hear me? Just barely. Good. All right. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Dr. Anyway. Blizzo, I know you can be loud. Actually, I can be loud. All right. across I the, yeah. All right. So uh, I just have a few slides. I'll, I'm going to go through them quickly um, and can certainly discuss any of them in detail um, with the panel. Uh, the first slide is really just a couple cases that we talked about. Um, I, first of all, I should say I was a member of the primary care advisory group uh, that looked at this for, uh, issue for a couple of years. And I was really interested in the prior authorization issue um, because I absolutely hate them, um, just to let you know where I stand on it. Um, so the first case, I had a young patient with hip pain. This guy had two ulcers that bled, requiring hospitalizations, emergency uh, procedures. He almost died after the first one. There's no way that when he has pain, he should ever be given a non-steroidal drug like ibuprofen. So when he came to me with hip pain before he was leaving for a trip, I said, let's give you some Celebrex, which is a selective uh, uh, pain reliever, um, the non steroidal pain reliever. And he uh, went to try to get it filled, and he came back and said the pharmacy needed a prior authorization. Um, an hour later, I still hadn't gotten, after phone calls and logging onto a website, creating an account and doing all these things for this patient, I still couldn't get him to Celebrex. Uh, he left on his trip, and he ended up taking a different kind of medication. He says it was an expired Celebrex. I think it was narcotics. Um, and that is definitely not the outcome that we want for that patient. And the insurance company that required the prior authorization covered both hospitalizations for his bleeding ulcers. So they should know better. Uh, the next uh, patient was another male athlete. Um, he was going to some NCAA championships, got some hip pain. I was worried about a femoral neck stress fracture, which can be catastrophic uh, up in the hip. Um, and so we got quickly got an x-ray. They oftentimes don't show up on x-ray, and the next thing you do is get an MRI. He needed his MRI the next day. We got an appointment slot set aside, and the insurance company required a prior authorization. You should know that my rate of um, getting denied on a prior authorization is zero. I get approved 100% of the time, but I have to do them anyway. So uh, he, it was Friday, uh, it was Thursday afternoon. The appointment was going to be on Friday. They were requiring a 48-hour uh, review period, even though I requested expedited uh, review. And he ended up, um, it wasn't going to happen. And then he was going to leave for the NSA championships, not knowing if he could run or not. Uh, now, that might not be a big deal to some people, but that's a huge deal to someone that's done that, uh, dedicated their, their sports career to that, uh, for a championship meet. So what he did was, he, the point of the story is, he went to the ER the next day because his insurance company doesn't require prior authorization if it comes out of the ER. He got his MRI, his insurance had to pay for the MRI, and they also had to pay for the ER visit. And all this could have been done out of my office. So when we hear about cost, uh, I think these, things, these are the kinds of things that, that frustrate me. They're just a couple small examples, I have dozens. If you wanna see what a, prior authorization phone call looks like, we're often asked, hey, call the insurance company, they'll fix it for you. I did one uh, on Monday to see if anything had changed. I usually don't, I usually refuse to call. Go to this website and watch the video. It's hilarious. And this is what happened to me on Monday. So I don't think things have changed that much. They take forever and you don't get the outcome you want. Green Mountain Care Board, as uh, Professor Holmes pointed out, looked at this, and I had this slide up, she mentioned it, uh, ad, ad administrative burden is the biggest threat uh, to people's practices, and it's what frustrates us the most, I believe, and they did a survey that showed that. The Academy of Family Medicine points out that these uh, prior authorizations pr present significant barriers to care. They direct valuable resources away from direct patient care. They lead to negative patient outcomes. I'm thinking about my, the guy that may have taken the narcotic. Um, and that we shouldn't have to do them if we're properly trained uh, and know what we're doing. And I agree with that statement. The uh, American Medical Association and a variety of other med medical organizations have uh, a series of principles they've issued. These are all available online and, and I think at the Green Mountain Care Board website. 
Um, principle number 20 is of interest to me because it's what the primary care advisory group came up with on its own, uh, and that is let's not have everybody do prior authorizations. If, you're, if you practice efficiently, then maybe you shouldn't have to do them, and just save the prior authorizations for the, for the physicians and, and nurse practitioners, et cetera, that don't practice efficiently. Uh, and it turns out the AMA said the same thing. We came up, we came up with that independently. Um, if you're interested in what we came up with uh, in detail, that's available on the website as well. We call it the preamble. This was the preamble to Bill uh, H342, uh, which we tried to introduce into the legislature um, this year and, and failed. Um, but the details are in there, and I won't go through that document. I think it's about five pages. But it's got a lot of detail and a lot of references to studies that have looked at prior authorizations and found them to be uh, not particularly helpful. Um, these were the recommendations that the, the primary care advisory group came up with. Eliminate prior authorizations for primary care providers in Vermont. Get rid of them. That's our recommendation after looking at it. Um, the insurers that were con concerned about cost containment, um, they could redeploy that prior authorization staff to educate uh, providers and, and uh, patients on appropriate use, do it as an educational model, but let's not have require us to do it when we get approved 100% of the time. Nuts. Um, there's medication prior authorizations. Um, <coughs> We, there's, there's some discussion about enhancing those systems. The, is, the, the problem is, when I'm in front of the computer at the electronic health record, and my patient's sitting in front of me and I'm gonna prescribe them a medication, I don't know if the formulary has changed. And so I could prescribe the medication, they go to the pharmacy and they get a, a, a bill, a charge for $300 instead of a $25 copay. So the smart patients will come back or call and say, hey, what's up? And then we'll go into figuring, trying to figure out why, and issue a new prescription, hopefully for the same class of medication, all designed to save the system money. That's great. Um, the patient then has to go back to the pharmacy and get the new prescription. The primary care advisory group heard uh, members talk about patients that didn't go back to the pharmacy, didn't take the medication, decompensated later, ended up in the emergency room with whatever the issue was, and then we have those costs associated with it. None of which have been represented, I think, in any financial assessment um, uh, when we're looking at uh, the cost that insure, the savings that insurers get. Uh, the other two, uh, item three and four, really are about providing educators, providing education from insurers uh, to people practicing medicine to make sure we're doing the right thing. Because I think we all want to do the right thing. We all want to save the system money and practice efficiently and with evidence-based care. And for those that don't, uh, those, the insurance companies can educate them a little more strongly uh, or urgently. Um, that's what our group came up with. Here, are, there's a few emails. and these are, these are some copies of emails that I, in my attempt to get our bill that uh, had the um, proposal, Bill H342, to eliminate prior authorizations, I kind of, I just pretty much got blown off. That, that didn't get anywhere. Uh, but it was an attempt. And those are just some emails that I got back from the legislators. Um, you know, when you think about uh, prior auths, one of the things we were talking about was burnout, right? Doctors getting burned out. And that's a really interesting concept. Because to get into medical school, survive medical school, survive residency and maybe fellowship, you have to be pretty tough. Um, you, get, you work long hours and there's a lot of uh, surprises that happen. And I, I gotta think that the non-resilient people get weeded out. So when you're thinking about burnout, it's, it's framed as burnout. When you're reading an article, there's something that says doctors are getting burned out. It's not that they're not resilient. And yoga classes and meditation and wellness classes, adding those are not gonna help. I think it's much better to frame in this Boston Globe article uh, that came out this summer that talks about burnout as moral injury. It's different. The moral injury that, that I think, and when I say doctors, I include nurse practitioners and, and physician assistants, so providers, but the moral injury here is the inability to provide timely care in our system to our patients and having to deal with what the patients come back to us with, with their issues. It can erode the doctor-patient relationship, it's incredibly frustrating, it's demoralizing, and it happens all the time. It's a death by a thousand cuts every single day. And when you, when you read, read the article, I encourage you, it's a page, two and a half pages, it, it outlines the uh, issue perfectly. Um, 
It's a moral injury. It's not burnout. It's not a lack of resilience. And the way to fix it isn't to add wellness. It's to get rid of the, the administrative burden. So I wasn't surprised when the American Psychiatric Association came out at their annual meeting and said that the rate of physician suicide is twice that of the general public. Now, I'm not saying that prior authorizations are directly causing an increased rate of physician suicide, but I think that moral injury piece is relevant. And we're supposedly going to have a lack of uh, doctors in Vermont. I haven't looked at this in, in great detail. This is a VPR piece. I know there's, uh, that's been talked about at, at the board, Greenmont Care Board. It's a threat. So if we're having doctors that are uh, having moral injury or burning out, they're leaving practice earlier, um, and this is happening in Vermont, this is going to be a real issue, especially, I think, in the rural areas where it may be harder to recruit physicians. My, my, my words only, uh, not that of the uh, advisory group. Um, and, you know, what does that cost? And Stanford looked at uh, burnout on, on their physician group, and they came up with 60 doctors that were going to leave practice early. And they estimated that it was going to cost anywhere from 15 to 55 million to replace those doctors who were leaving early because they were just fed up and burnt out. So, just remember that 100% of prior authorizations that I do get approved, but I have to do them every single day. And then ask me why I want to quit practice. And here's my solution. Um, I, I agree with the primary care advisory group. I think we all need to think like a surgeon, okay? Uh, someone that has a, a, a horrible uh, foot infection, um, we could do a lot of different things to improve that. We could make sure that they're hydrated, getting antibiotics, maybe improve the blood circulation in that area, do all these little fixes and hope that it doesn't get worse. But there are some surgeons who know, you know what, I have to, I have to kind of amputate above that infection to save the patient. And that's what I think we need to do with prior authorizations. I think we need to think like surgeons right now and just get rid of it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Peluso. So actually, I would love to just hear from the other two providers on the panel if you want to, we'll stay on this thread of prior auth for a second. Is there anything that you both would like to add just on that topic? And then I would welcome any other conversation about burden in a second, but about prior auths. Um, so I, I can talk about it too. Um, I would have stand up and applaud if, I, if it wasn't appropriate. Um, I absolutely agree with everything you said. My, my success rate prior office is also about 100%. Um, and we go through them every single day. And they're agonizing and time consuming. I saw your time time was only seven minutes. And I had oh, my nurse on the, on the phone for 45 minutes, 50 minutes, 55 minutes for a single prior raw. Um, and they always get approved eventually because they're not ordering them appropriately. Um, I think by nature, physicians, PAs, and MPs are competitive souls. That's how we got into school, how we got where we are. So when you show someone a chart that shows them they're an outlier, they tend to self-correct anyway. So I don't think you need to be punitive to an entire group. I think if you show data, I know some of the insurers in the Blue Cross does that, and does that you know, they show data and say, look, here's where you are relative to your peers um, in an unblinded fashion. I think it'll, it'll pull people in the direction they want, they want to go. Yeah. Um, I also work for my specials. I didn't realize how frustrating the prior auth for surgery procedures was, but one of my uh, ob guide folks said, especially Medicaid prior auth for hysterectomies are an absolute nightmare. And again, they always get approved, but they're an absolute nightmare of paperwork and faxing and phone calls. And then and the end result is always the same. They always get approved. The, the flip side is that once they do the hysterectomy, they're also under reimbursed, and so they get paid less for it. So they spend more time getting approved, and they end up with less money on the back side as well. I'll just add that um, the time spent by our staffs doing the prior auths is extraordinary. And when we hear from insurers that this is cost effective and it, and it decreases costs to have prior auths, I think that's really because a lot of that cost is shifted onto the primary care practices. And I, I will mention a little more of that when I, do, when I do my presentation about how the costs really are not captured, I think, accurately. Okay. Fantastic. Well, thank you for that. So let me bounce it over then to um, Michael Costa. If you could talk a little bit. I know you, Diva has experimented with um, trying to reduce or eliminate prior auths, and I would love to hear from you uh, a little bit about the results of that experiment, the motivation behind it, and some of the results. Sure. Uh, thank you very much to have me today. Michael Costa, I serve as Deputy Commissioner at Vermont Medicaid and Department of Vermont Health Access, and I help work on 
our healthcare reform efforts. And so just to give you the background, the situation for us with provider administrative burden is one, we hear provider frustration on administrative burden, and we take it seriously. Um, we don't view it as complaining, we view it as an opportunity to be collaborative, to try to make the system work better and take care of our beneficiaries. Um, and we want to empower provider-led reform. I think if you take a look at healthcare reform in Vermont, and particularly the all-care model and ACO-based reform, it's premised on the idea that the provider community is the focal point of reform. And so as a state and as Medicaid, we're really in a position of trying to help providers um, by being realistic and, and collaborative about administrative burden. Uh, if you take a look at our ACO contract, where, is, where we've done some experimentation about administrative burden, uh, the basic premise for our viewpoint is that if providers are willing to take on financial risk, then we should give them more freedom and flexibility, uh, particularly around prior authorizations. And so the ACO contract, which the state started in 2017, tried to deliver on a very simple talking point, which is if you're in the ACO, there's a waiver of prior authorization. Now, that's the situation. The complication is that we had never done that before. And any time your talking points meet your operations, there's some sort of clash, and you have to figure out how it's really going to work. And so the key questions for us were, one, how do you implement it? And then are we as state government capable of incremental improvement if it doesn't work the way we want it to work? So what happened? And I think it's useful to just kind of follow where we've been and where we're going. In 2017, when Diva first worked with OneCare, to have a prior authorization waiver. You know, that talking point was so simple, it seemed like a turnpike and the, the, the gate just went up, right? And everybody's supposed to drive through. That is certainly not the way it was implemented. We said, okay, if you have an attributed member, someone who's part of the ACO population, and you're a participating provider in the ACO's network, and the service for which you're seeking a waiver is part of the total cost of care, so i.e. you're under financial risk for it, then you get your prior authorization waiver. What we quickly learned was that process was more cumbersome than prior authorizations. Right? And so instead of saying, oh, well, we tried, we went back to the drawing board. Say, OK, one well, care, we, we're committed to that idea. How do we improve it? So we made some incremental improvement for 2018. Um, we said, OK, it has to be an attributed member and a total cost of care service, but it doesn't need to be a participating provider. So in other words, the prior authorization waiver followed the person. Um, now, it still involves seeing whether that person is in the program and it's a relevant service. And so it's simplified a little bit, but it's not totally there. And what we're thinking of trying to do in the future is to, for 2019, hopefully piloting at some point a prior authorization waiver that follows the practice. So if you're a Vermont practice and you're in the ACO's network, to the extent you have one person on your panel that's in the ACO program, we'll just lift prior authorization for the whole practice for Medicaid beneficiaries. There are some operational issues in trying to bring that to life, but we're really committed to trying to pilot that. Um, under, and, and really looking at that as a fulfillment of the all payer model's goals to try to make it sort of the rules the same across all three payers, and to allow some real freedom and flexibility in the way people practice. And so we're trying to get there um, to a point where that sort of freedom and accountability match up pretty well. I think the other thing, so the three big lessons we've learned are, hey, we need to be flexible, and I'm hoping we are, and we're really grateful for OneCare's partnership as we listen to them about what their provider network is seeing and how we might improve it. Um, two, communication needs to flow up, down, and sideways. We have not always been great about articulating what we're trying to do, why we're trying to do it, and how it's supposed to work. So we've taken that to heart, and we really want to work with folks. For example, we're seeing a lot of belts and suspenders where people who have a PA waiver send in the form anyways. And so you know, we know we have a lot of work to do to make sure people are educated so they're not engaging in something that's a waste of time for them and a waste of time for us. And then the third big point is we need to be realistic about the limits of administrative simplification. And so we learned something here that we talked about prior authorization waiver in a very simple way. There's a gate, it's open. What we learned though that is that it really isn't about utilization management in an ACO-based world. It's about patient care and safety. So to give you an example, we've now learned that the prior authorization waiver probably has some permanent limitations. And this is particularly true around durable medical equipment. Where, you know, if you're setting up a lift or someone needs to get help getting out of bed, we, we want someone to check out whether that's safe, right? You could really harm someone. 
So we think there's going to be a small subset of codes that just aren't appropriate for a PA uh, And right now, in our initial look at it, it's mostly durable medical equipment. And so instead of talking about it as utilization management, we're trying to talk about it as patient care and safety, which is for most codes, um, what your doctor believes is, what your practitioner believes is best is the right thing, and we're going to wait PA. For a small subset of codes, yeah, we'll probably, as a matter of patient care and safety, continue to require some sort of authorization. And I just give that example as a point of, um, we all need to have an honest dialogue about the limits of administrative simplification. From what, speaking for myself, I don't think we're anywhere close to limitations. I think there's still a lot of progress we can make collaboratively to um, get the world in a place where you're spending more time working with people on their health and their concerns rather than our administrative goals. But I think at some point we'll get to the edge of the water where it's, okay, we've gone as far as we can, but even in a capitated world under the ECO, I still want shadow claims to know what happened, right? On some subset of codes, I probably still need someone to check in to make sure that wheelchair fits right, so nobody ends up with sores. But we are really committed to talking with folks and seeing what we can realistically do, and I think most importantly, given the culture of state government, I'm really happy that this has been an iterative process, and we're trying to make continuous incremental progress to be helpful to the provider. Can you just speak a little bit about the, the impact on costs as a result of the prior authorization waiver? Um, so in a little bit, I, for us it's interesting, we think since the prior authorization has been a little, a waiver has been cumbersome up front, we're not really seeing a change in the number of prior auths, right? And so there is, it's hard at that point to figure out whether it's driving changes in costs. I would say that um, at some point this week we will publish the 2017 PCO program results. And um, I think we're going to be really careful about what we can say definitively about it, given the fact it's one data point. Um, but, you know, it will be interesting to follow that over time. I think like most insurers, we do utilization management because we have a hypothesis that one, it works financially, and two, um, more is not always better in healthcare, so we just want to be careful about what, what people get. Um, but we're very much willing to, to take a look at it. I would also say one other idea that came up, we, we definitely talk about gold carding some folks to the extent someone scores 100 percent over a period of time uh, that creates a persuasive argument that we trust their judgment and there should be a simplified process i don't think we've got to the point where we're ready to launch something like that but it's certainly part of our current dialogue at diva about whether that's an appropriate response uh, particularly for folks that are part of the financial accountability that is the accountability so maybe, maybe I'll ask Dr. Ward if you want to talk a little bit since OneCare has been part of that conversation about, you know, going ahead, how can OneCare Vermont, you know, attract providers into the network by expanding some of these PA waivers or other types of, you know, administrative burden reduction? Thank you. Nice. And then I want... The PA waivers for imaging procedures and medications, or just the medications were not included in the original waiver, correct? No, it's, it's still constrained to the total cost of care. So if things are in there, for example, prescriptions are not. Um, we are having a good dialogue internally about whether that makes sense, right, and about what happens outside the ACO program. And so I'd say for us, everything's on the table, but so far our efforts have been in that ball of services that are inside our ACO contract. But we get that to the extent you're doing one thing one way and one thing another way, that that's part uh, for the practice. And so we're talking about, you know, how much financial risk we're willing to bear in service of really testing administrative simplification of the system. <clears throat> so I want to echo, echo Michael's um, comments about the cooperative effort that has been going on between uh, OneCare and Diva in relation to trying to wrestle with these thorny issues. Um, uh, when the waiver went into initial uh, formulation in 2017, uh, Diva asked us, and we were interested, obviously, as well, to take the some 800 different codes between durable medical equipment, every single different kind of imaging study that you might get, um, uh, certain uh, formally prior authorization requiring surgical procedures, um, and, um, uh, and, and certain laboratory tests. So about 800 different codes, and so we created an app using the claims data that uh, Diva would send us to 
basically trend over time. Okay, this the PA waiver went into effect on February of 2017. What is happening, in fact, to the rate of imaging MRIs and CAT scans, for example? Um, the, and, and I think we've shown some of that data to you uh, at the Green Mountain Care Board. So, the long story short, the trend is, is basically horizontal flat. Okay, so the the assumption that uh, somehow um, no longer having prior authorization would cause skyrocketing use of services was not borne out. But again, to reflect what Michael was saying, we're really not sure how many, uh, how the behaviors didn't change. Were people in fact continuing to seek prior authorization anyway because they couldn't figure out whether patient A had an attribution or patient B did not. And so we, we really have not you know, yet had a great uh, test of, of the premise that um, removal, removing prior authorization is um, going to result in increased um, expenditures and volume driven services. Um, I would also say that the, the other premise to realize is that in a capitated model, uh, at least those entities within one care that are on a fixed payment, which reflects the hospitals, the hospital employed clinicians, um, and the primary care practices that are participating in our uh, CPR um, pilot, uh, the, the, the financial um, arguments for do more, get paid more, has gone away. Um, that's not to say that there might still be um, you know, um, volume-driven motives in the rest of our network that is still being paid fee for service, but we really have not seen that. So I want to give uh, Dr. Flavin and Dr. Kilby a chance to, to, to respond to the emotional, you know, the passion that we heard from the providers about the, you know, the administrative burden that prior auths are taking, and to some extent, some of the experimentation that's being done with One Care and Diva with reducing those waivers. I'm curious to hear from both of you the value to you of these waivers, I mean, of these prior authorizations, and to the extent that you've explored or investigated reducing the usage of that um, to reduce the burden that's in, it's imposing on providers. Good afternoon, I'm Kim Kilby. Since finishing my family medicine residency here at UVM over a decade ago, I've been in various positions that look at the intersection between the care of individual patients and the care of populations, and that's what led me to MVP. I started there in June. I'm a regional medical director for the East, uh, which includes Vermont and also Capital District in Northern New York. So I'm happy to be here today. Um, I think there's a, a couple of things, and I'm still learning. Um, however, the MVP is in active negotiation with One Care, and I think from our perspective, we have not become part of the all-payer model yet, and so we're certainly looking at that and very excited about some of the work that they're doing with Medicaid and, um, and trying to figure out ways in which you can reduce administrative burden and it not have a negative impact on patient care decisions, and I think um, from my perspective, a lot of what drives some of the prior authorization is, is, is cost is important, but also it, the right care for the patient and not, and not over treating and, and excessive care and that maybe sometimes things don't have to be done. Um, so we're, we're really you know, anxious to really see the outcomes of, of how that experiment has been going and and certainly willing to partner on similar efforts once we become part of One Care. Um, I think the providers that spoke, uh, you know, you have a hundred percent success rate with your prior authorization, but that's not what we see across the board with providers. Otherwise, I don't think any of us would be sitting here. <laughs> None of us want to waste time. Uh, we don't want to waste our time. We don't want to waste your time. We don't want to waste the patient's time. And I think um, the numbers are different than 100% all the time. Uh, if you've spoken about radiology and pharmacy, and we've also heard a little bit about DME. 
and all of those have different rates of approval and denial. Um, you know, I looked at our information before coming here today, and uh, we still have uh, over 20% of the primary care physician radiology requests result in a denial or a withdrawal of that request. And um, so I think, and there's, a, and there's a variation between primary care requests for imaging versus specialty requests for imaging, they have a lower denial rate. So certainly we're interested in any ways to collaborate on what's still gonna make sure that we get the right care to the, to the right patient and the right test is being ordered. But we know that, we know that it's, not, it's not perfect uh, in terms of the, the providers always choosing the right test for the patient's clinical presentation. On the, on the pharmacy side, I think um, we are actively working on ways uh, to improve our pharmacy practices at the same time as high cost pharmaceuticals are really driving a lot of um, strain on health plans, but I also think on every part of the, the healthcare system. Uh, but we're, we, we look at our policies on a regular basis. We've removed 28 drugs since January of this year from the prior authorization list, and that's constantly changing as drugs come in, other drugs come off. Um, and then, you know, there's just a lot of very high cost medications that it's important to ensure that that's the appropriate medication um, for the patient. And so that's what that prior authorization process is intended to do. Um, I think that you may hear more about this, but I, I think, you know, if we go back five, 10 years, most primary care physicians were really excited about what the potential for electronic medical records that could maybe help reduce this burden. And, um, and we haven't seen as great results uh, across the board. Uh, you know, I think there's some, some potential for real-time benefit determination when prescribing pharmaceuticals that, it, that is another, you know, yeah, EMR, uh, electronic real-time modality that could help. Um, and certainly, uh, we are we partner with uh, pharmacy benefit manager CVS Caremark, and we're looking at ways we can leverage that. Um, so I think there's a there's a couple of different. Um, there, there's several different topics we're talking about here, and I think it's also important to sort of talk about them uh, separately because they, they come with their own um, uh, issues and, and justification and reasons. So um, I'll just say that MVP really is uh, focused on what's going on in Vermont, which is very unique, and, uh, and looking at the benefits and um, the exciting outcomes, uh, potential of what One Care is doing and becoming uh, part of that process as well. So let me just follow up quickly mm -hmm. um, with that, which is I'm encouraged to hear that uh, MVP is seriously having conversations with One Care. That's uh, wonderful news. But let me just ask specifically, you had mentioned that there are different, um, you know, radiology may be different than other areas, primary care may be different than specialty care. So specifically to the suggestion that was made over here about having a gold card, I mean, is that something that MVP is seriously exploring of identifying those providers that may be, um, you know, clear indications suggest that they're not over utilizers, they're not prescribing additional unnecessary treatments, giving them a gold pass. I mean, that seems like a compromise in the middle if you're really trying to identify the overutilizers and the unnecessary care, identify that, and then have the prior authorizations applied to that group of providers and those that are clear, you know, underutilizers or appropriate <coughs> utilizers. I mean, yeah, I think how serious are those conversations? There's conversations happen on a regular basis. Um, for Vermont, we're certainly focused on the one care negotiation and arrangement right now. Um, and we're constantly looking at ways in which we could have a program that could allow to reduce these burdens and still get the right care to the patient. And I think whatever program that is has to be fair and it has to be driven by data. And I think that's the data piece is really where. Um, some of the, some of the, um, it, it just hasn't been clear yet. And again, we're very excited to see the data behind the One Care Diva um, approach 
and certainly would be willing to consider something like that if the data is there to support that it's a good idea for, for our patient safety, not just cost. So if I could just <clears throat> excuse me, follow up on that question. Sure. I, I feel like I only talk to the good doctors because mm -hmm. every doctor that I've spoken to <clears throat> is like Ivory Snow. They may not have a 100% record like Dr. Peluso, but um, it, it seems like they're 99 point something percent pure. And do you have any distribution? It sounds like you're collecting data on um, denials. Um, what is the range of the distribution of what you consider the gold standard for a Dr. Peluso of 100%? What would be the worst case scenario that you have as far as denial rates? And you know what? It, what is really the uh, I have the standard deviation and, and things like that? I don't know standard deviation, but I have some of that. Um, so to answer that specifically, we uh, Medicaid had prior to the uh, all pair model and the ACO, we, they had a gold carding uh, pilot. And in fact, you probably know the Mountain Care Board led a pilot as well in radiology. Uh, but the, the Medicaid pilot um, had some parameters in terms of how many, and it was specifically for radiology, how many uh, uh, studies, you ha studies you had to order in a year, and then what was the impact? You know, what was your denial rate, as it were? Um, and so we modeled that with our uh, population here in Vermont. Uh, and if we use the Medicaid criteria, I would only be able, using their criteria, would be only be able to uh, gold card 80 providers in the state, Dr. Peluso being one of them. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, j just to give you kind of a, a size, the average denial uh, rate is a, somewhere in the 15% uh, impact. Um, there's really very few providers, very few that are below 5%, um, and most of them range between 5 and 25%, which with the kind of education zone being above 25%. And this is using, I mean, I look at radiology as being a commodity. It's appropriate use criteria. All of the criteria that are out there are very standard, uh, dictated by the American College of Radiology. Um, we are actively talking to the ACO about uh, mirroring uh, the uh, DIVA approach in radiology. Um, but you have to look at, 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 at um, well, I can talk about administrative burden having been a primary care provider in the state of Vermont, and it depends on the eye of the beholder. When I was, when I was working in Chelsea, it was the EMR, and it was uh, DIVA, pharmacy. It wasn't radiology for me. It was Medicaid and pharmacy and the EMR, which was the burden. Um, uh, so that, that you know, that there is, there's a lot, a lot goes into the burden thing. PA is a piece of it. PA is one of many ways to um, control or incent the right appropriate use. Um, pharmacy is its own animal because it's about adhering to formulary, step therapy, quantity limits, and safety. And it's less about PAs. Uh, PAs are maybe a mechanism, and there's a better way to do that. So uh, what providers want, and what we heard in the primary care advisory group, is transparency um, and easy access and convenience to just know what, what's within the realm of uh, appropriateness in terms of a formulary to prescribe their patients. And a real-time prescription benefit program is currently live in Cerner um, at Rutland and Brattleboro. It went live about a month ago. Um, so we're actually in active contact with them because it will take, we're on one side of, of that program and the provider's on the other side, and we need to talk to each other to, to make sure that it works correctly. Um, but that will be a, a significant advance. It will be rolled out in Epic as another EMR in um, November, I believe. And then other EMRs are also uh, moving in that direction. And that's a little complicated because there's an, a middleman within that it's called SureScripts. So, as Dr. Ward knows, uh, so we, we do need to be in close co communication and push on both sides of that issue to make sure that process actually gets to where we want. Because then, I wouldn't. I, I certainly don't see a need for having as much uh, requirements around PA if it's built into the system. Um, 
medical procedures, things that are on the edge of, of uh, standard versus still being studied, uh, new procedures. There's going to be continue to be some criteria for that, I think, and a need for that. Um, those constantly evolve. We retire policies. We put new policies on. Those are less. It's a smaller percentage of what we do. In terms of primary care, the biggest impact is radiology and pharmacy. Um, so if we can step forward in radiology in partnership with uh, the ACO and through the all-pair model um, to monitor utilization, educate, I see no reason why we couldn't evolve our processes. Um, on the pharmacy side, I think we can use technology to get where we need to be um, because that is a very complex thing. The formulary at Medicaid versus Blue Cross versus MVP is all very different. Um, and it, it, that is, to some degree, a safety issue, to some degree of a cost issue. Radiology and medical procedures are more very straight, evidence-based, appropriate use criteria. Um, so that, that's, that's where I just wanted to start. I, I look forward to the discussion. I want to hear innovative ideas. I don't think that, I think Mark's on the right track, but I think, you know, it's, it's too blunt an instrument uh, to mandate elimination of all PAs. Let's work together to eliminate some. Let's work together to use technology as best as we can. He's not wrong in saying, God, the pair, hope it wasn't us, uh, the pair who <laughs> required the PA for Celebrex knew the patient had two vi inpatient visits for a GI bleed and should have had kind of sophisticated enough technology, which I admit we don't have right now, um, to identify that that patient didn't need PA. That's a great suggestion. So I think there's a lot of opportunity. How do we make those opportunities happen? This is a wonderful, you know, couple hours we're going to spend together here, but to some extent, I worry that this is going to be the conversation and everybody's going to go back to their offices and we're not going to come up with some solutions that are really so, workable. So I'm wondering, I mean, you know, it sounds like with the uh, live prescription drug in the EMR, that's, that's a step inflated. forward. You know, you mentioned the, uh, the um, 80 providers that might, got a, might get a gold pass. My guess is if, if 80 providers get that gold pass, others are going to want that gold pass. I mean, you're going to start the competitiveness as was mentioned, I think could encourage other providers to do what they need to do to get that gold pass to. And I'm wondering, that seems like a really workable potential solution that would be cost effective still, because you'd be targeting the group of providers that are overutilizers and relieving the other providers of that burden. I mean, I, I would love to see outside, of, I think OneCare is a wonderful vehicle to try and reduce some of this burden, but I also think that not everybody is, is has access to OneCare or is going to be in one care for a whole host of reasons. Yeah, so How we, do we also reduce the burden for those providers. Well, so I can only speak for Blue Cross, right? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, th th this is a this is brand new about three weeks ago that I actually got what I asked for, which was a modeling of how we would do this. Yeah. And so now it's a question of just implementing it. Right. Um, so no, I have no problem doing that. Um, I certainly also want to look at some alternative models as well because I think that just well. That chips away at it. Yeah. It helps a little. Right. Um, but if Dr. Ward and his analytic team can monitor utilization, identify outliers, and work on a, with, in a provider led fashion through the ACO, I think that's a parallel pathway that we would be willing to go down. Before we get off the topic of prior offs, I want to open up the questions to the board about prior offs, but just see if anybody on the panel who hasn't spoken yet or has some ideas about prior offs would care to contribute any ideas or solutions. I'd love to hear. Yes, yes. Dr. Earlier. So a couple, and so um, this is, some of this is an out of my administrative warehouse, so I'm speaking as a provider here, but um, the one, one area where I noticed prior authorizations um, were substantially less of an issue, and the reason will be obvious, was uh, when I was in the VA Medical Center at, uh, in Philadelphia. And this was just as a student, but nevertheless. Um, and the reason was consistency. And you knew what the formulary was, and it was clear there was a progression of which medications we used. It was evidence-based, it was agreed upon. Um, and the other 
circumstance in my professional career where I've seen a glimmer of that was actually when I started primary care in Vermont and the, the Medicaid state formula, because so many of my patients were Medicaid, it's at least something you can keep track of. It's, it's, you know, it's not perfect. We've heard some examples of what ways it can be better. But if, if the formularies were universal, that would go a long way. I would know how I, where to start, where to, and I wouldn't have to go through what's the patient's coverage, who's this. I agree there's some opportunities for our health records to help us with that. I will say that you know, as, as the biggest um, provider of services in the state, um, we do not yet have the electronic health record technology that is crisp enough to, to leverage to know the patient's uh, health plan. So if the University of Vermont Medical Center has not put that in place, I think it's unlikely many people have had. So I, you know, I don't, but some, some uniformity would be, uh, would be extraordinarily helpful. The other situation that I think, um, and I'm curious some of my uh, provider colleagues will uh, share this frustration, when you have a patient who's had a chronic condition for years, and there's very good reasons that they're on the medications they're on, having to go through that prior off on an annual basis is extraordinarily cumbersome. And it, we actually, we almost have to pull some staff offline after the first of the year. It's a big cost. And it, it inhibits our ability to take care of other things in the office because all of a sudden we have to have all these people invested in this process. And it's the same story as last year, right? Um, or maybe it's the same, and if it were the exact same story, that would be easy. We often we do send the same information. But we sent you that information last year, but the story might be a little bit different. So if there was some memory built into the system that can understand, and I understand it's a little bit challenging because you know we can think of the barrier to that, right? So um, you know, uh, evidence-based recommendations change, etc. But having to go through that, and in the worst cases, it's our patients who've been suffering for a long time. You know, it took us a long time to get to this uh, medical regimen for them, and they're getting some piece of. Uh, I'm thinking of a couple specific patients right now. Finally, we we make them have a patient with a chronic condition who chronic medical condition who has discomfort every time she eats, and we finally found the right set of medications for her that minimizes that, and as soon as that gets blown up, and it happens with some periodicity, you say, okay, I guess I'll be uncomfortable eating again for the next couple of months. So if there can be some memory in the system, um, ours too, right, and ours as well, that would be a big deal. So okay, MVP okay. and Blue Cross have three-year prior odds, just so you know? We don't do I'm annual. I, I don't know. I, I, no, but I, you know, I, I get it. I, yeah, that's, well, there's churn, that's the issue. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's the, that was addressed years ago at least with our two commercial so pairs. that ships win, but we still absolutely see the problem in our practice. So it's, it's good that that's, that's a great start. Does MVP have, what is the, is it annual? Three, three or three four years. chronic conditions like Jim was talking about. I just wanted to make a point about the, the pair that's not on the panel today is Medicare. They, I don't think they're in right. humans. Yeah. They're Medicare. <laughs> um, they, the Part D Medicare insurance policies for medications are no different, better, or worse than any of the commercial or Medicaid formula. So there, there is no, um, uh, Medicare is not distinguished as you know being better in that respect because it's the same type of formulary um, uh, maintenance. On the other hand, Medicare, um, they don't really have prior authorization uh, they have local and national coverage decisions. And if a, any of the clinicians here, or providers of care in the state, start doing things that are not meeting the criteria, often retrospectively they will be denied payment. So it's, it's, a, it's an after the fact, you didn't understand the rules, you went ahead and did it anyway, and we're not going to pay you. I mean, I spent years of my life arguing with the recovery audit contractors of Medicare trying to justify why somebody was sick enough to be admitted to the hospital. So it was a retrospective uh, battle uh, to retain the, the money that you'd already been sent uh, and not have Medicare take it back because of, um, because of conflict about whether something was medically appropriate. So um, I just bring up Medicare because they don't have continuing stay review, utilization review in the hospital. You know, historically, many insurance companies have 
demanded, why does the patient continue to still need to be in the hospital today? If you can't come up with a good reason, we will stop paying you. You can keep them in the hospital, but there will be no further dollars coming because we consider them not to be sick enough. Uh, with Medicare, that doesn't happen. If you decide they need to stay in the hospital, they can stay in the hospital uh, because that's the right thing to do. I would just add one more thing. There's there's that moment when you're sitting on a panel in front of the state's health care regulator and you're like, you're the only non-provider. Um, <laughs> a lawyer and a Medicaid administrator. Um, so I just say that that to me gives me one quick advantage, which is I don't have the personal history of all this stuff. And sometimes I think that strategically we need to do some forgetting. Uh, because I'll give you just a quick example. Uh, we've been really trying to reinvigorate our relationship with Dartmouth Medical Center. Um, they had some real frustration with us about the way residents uh, got into our system. This is evidently something they've been trying to fix for years with us. And, but they weren't telling us, like, it was just, it was kind of one of those conversations where everybody had their grievances. And then once we figured out what they wanted, we were able to fix it in about six months. And that's a long way of saying, it's not always apparent to us in these conversations that have been going on for a long time what specific thing you want us to solve. So I think it does take some forgetting about the past battles to say, here are the three things we really want. And have we can all agree on what the three specific administrative burden problems we want to solve are, I think we can make some incremental progress on that. Um, and so in, in our, our team is as guilty of it as anybody. I will tell you, when, when I talk to our clinical operations unit, they are great folks. But they've got some bumps and bruises from having done this for a decade. And so we're trying to send them the same message, which is, hey, let's let's try to, you know, be open to having these conversations in a new way and having some really specific problems that we want to solve. And actually with that in mind, I mean in some ways, if we were to have this meeting a year from now, what would the I, my hope is that the conversation is not the same one. And how do we ensure that the conversation is not the same one? I mean, what is, what's going to happen between now and, say, a year from now that we're going to make sure that these conversations are happening? I mean, I think the one care vehicle seems like that's going to be an appropriate avenue for many of the providers in the state. I just want to make sure that there's some, what are the action steps or what are the meetings or something that can actually make sure that these conversations continue? No, I'd throw that out there without an answer. I don't have an answer to your question. Okay, then we're moving on. No, no I, I don't. I don't know that we're exactly moving on. I have some things I wanted to say about administrative burden, but not specifically about. Yeah. So I'm actually going to jump right to you in a second. Okay. That's okay. Yes. Fine. You're going to be my next person. I just want to make sure that the board also. I want to ask if you guys have any questions about specifically prior off, and then we're going to jump to you about other administrative Great. burdens. But I wanted to kind of go through this thread yeah. all at once. Yep. Could I, just, could I just say one other thing about uh, putting in a plug for scale targets? Right. Okay? It's just to say that any of the clinicians here, if they have a limited number of their patients that are in the uh, you know, health reform programs, the ACO programs, they are having the foot in both canoes and they have to have two separate processes. So, um, you know, we are hoping to you know, promote as, as Vermont is with the all-payer model, trying to promote a, a larger and larger percentage so that the familiarity of the clinician community will be understanding what the prior authorization waivers actually mean for them so that their staff can become more familiar with that. So uh, my question uh, is actually related in some, somewhat to scale, somewhat to Norm's previous point around you know, Medicare and the Medicare rules, um, but I think is really targeted more to MVP and Blue Cross. Um, I'm, because my, what I, my thinking is, to the point that we don't actually have all the payers here, and in fact, the largest group of insured Vermonters <laughs> outside of Medicare and Medicaid are in the self-insured uh, employer market, which quite frankly the state is not allowed to regulate um, and currently is a very small piece of uh, the ACO. Uh, how do we attack some of these same issues around prior authorization in that space? Because I think it would have to come from the, the insurers who are providing third-party administration services to those employers. 
Uh, so it would have to be, you know, obviously to get those lives in that population means that they would have to purchase that as a product. And as part of that product would be a implicit buy-in into the contractual arrangements with the ACO, which with, with all the same, with, with the same structure as we might with our health exchange population. So I think it's kind of um, uh, the standard, making that approach standard through the product would be probably the way to go. And because we, you're right, the problem with the self-funded population, the, the client has every right mm -hmm. to choose not to pay for the blueprint, for example. Um, and, uh, and that does happen. Um, and so we need to be able to translate value to our clients in a clear, transparent way. And, you know, we can cajole them and say this is a really good idea, but um, some of our, most of our clients are not unsophisticated. And, and so say, prove it to me, show me the value of working with uh, the ACO. Um, why should I be involved? Now, um, so I think that's, that's a, a good point. One other point I wanted to add to the scale target is, you know, there was a good RAND study about provider behavior and the, the population of your patients who you see n who are involved with a value-based program of some sort probably needs to be more than 30% for you to actually change your behavior. Otherwise, it's just kind of an annoyance. Um, and and uh, most providers don't have a way of identifying exactly who's ACO attributed and who's not, and so I'll just PA everyone, in a sense. Um, in addition, if I were to go forward with the gold carding uh, pilot, I, I think about Dr. Peluso for a second. And just to use it as an example, sorry. Um, you know, I don't know that, I don't know off the top of my head um, if next year he'll have 10 Blue Cross uh, patients or 100. And, um, and so just looking at monitoring utilization through one payer's perspective may not be enough, especially if you're talking about something like radiology, which I say is a bit of a commodity, the standards are the standards. Um, could there be pooled, a pooled approach to that um, in terms of taking data from multiple pairs to identify the gold card. Do you see what I'm saying? Sure. Uh, I don't know how to do that, yeah. um, but maybe Norm can help me think about that. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I, I think one of the problems with this is that it will preferentially identify in a given year those who see a lot of Blue Cross patients. If I could just follow up, I, I, I appreciate those thoughts um, because I, to Jess's point, like in how do we know we won't be in the same place next year, I can actually see a next year where Blue Cross MVP Diva have made great, great strides, but Dr. Peluso is still pulling his hair out because <laughs> Mo, you know, perhaps that's a subset of his patient population and, and does, isn't enough to, for him to really feel the difference. Which is, which is why I think we should just, you know, it goes back to these small um, steps towards eliminating the burden. And I, I'm sitting here listening, thinking, when is it going to be done? When is it going to change? And I won't hear it. Um, so, I want to leave practice uh, as soon as I can. Uh, I love taking care of patients, but when 30% of what you do is paperwork, uh, that doesn't help them. It sucks the joy right out of the, out of the job. And, um, and I, I'd love to flip it around and, and say, hey, Vermont, we don't have to do this. We figured it out. We took a, we took a little bit of a risk financially. We said, let's get rid of prior authorizations. Uh, you want to come practice where you can take care of your patients uh, freely and openly? Hey, we're on board with that. Let's go. Let's, let's uh, come on in. I think it should be great. Uh, and if guess what? If you're a um, inefficient provider of care, if you don't play by the rules, they're going to be coming and knocking on your door and saying, "Hey, what are you doing?" And it, it would reward the people that do a good job. And I, I think it's a simple solution. I think, you know, think like a surgeon. Just kind of 
I know it's more it doesn't solve your self-insured problem, though, because we could pass that Vermont law and it wouldn't impact that group. Okay. That's too bad. It is too bad. Anybody else on the board want to jump in on anything on prior odds? Uh, yes, just one quick question, uh, MVP. Um, is the fact that a small portion of your overall business is in Vermont versus New York, are you, do you feel at all fettered about making uh, decisions here in Vermont that are good for Vermont, but we may be ahead of New York uh, in that regard? Do we feel, what was the word? I missed the, the word. Do we feel? Fettered. Fettered. Fettered, fettered. okay. <laughs> Liber limited in, fettered. Um, yeah, okay. Burdened. So, no, I think we look at Vermont and New York as two completely different animals, because they are. Um, and actually, I think how much membership we have in New York State actually is a value add to being able to bring ideas to the table here, because it's Vermont is doing some really interesting, unique things in a very different way than New York State is doing some interesting, unique things with value-based care arrangements around the state. So um, also our membership is growing in Vermont. So we are excited about that. That's why we're in active negotiation with the all-payer model and willing to be at the table. And I'm looking forward to being at the table with more of the very interesting work being done here in Vermont. We had a nice meeting with the Blueprint this morning. And so learning about those things as our membership is growing again in Vermont is very important to us. Does that answer your question? OK. Uh, you know, first, I'd say, you know, I think underlying, you know, everybody wants to give the right level of care you know, to the patients. And I think you know, that's kind of the same on both sides. But I wonder you know, if we, if we you know, kind of dive into some of the costs and perceive savings. So I think on the insurance side, right, we may say, OK, if 20% is denied, you know, that that's, that's a savings. But I don't think we have a comprehensive understanding of what all the other costs are that are in the system on both sides. So I mean, I think on the insurance side, if people are on the phone for 45 minutes, you know, that's costs that you guys are incurring for all of those, you know, people to manage that side of the service. And on the, you know, practice side, obviously you have all those people on the calls as well, but not only that, people may be circumventing by, like we said, going to the ER and having all these other ways to maybe get the same thing, you know, done. So, I mean, you know, we talk about savings to the system, but I don't think we really have an understanding, you know, I'm just throwing out there, of really what the costs are, both from the insurance side to monitor it, from the practice side, and some of the things on the practices side we've brought up is, you know, we don't have enough primary care practitioners, right? And if you're doing less of this on your job, then we don't need as many more to fill. You know, I know it's not always the practitioner that's doing it, it might be somebody else in the office, but, you know, there's a whole bunch of different things in there, so you need then less recruitment and stuff. So I'm just throwing out, you know, in general, and maybe it's something whether the board can help follow up on, but, you know, how do we understand from a cost side what the true costs are? Because we, you know, we, we think kind of the savings, but that's, that's really one piece of it. And, you know, I would even challenge on the self-insured side, if on the self-insured side, businesses felt that overall this wasn't increasing their costs, why couldn't they do it away with the prior offs too? You know, if, if they looked at it as it's really not saving costs. So, I mean, it's, I don't expect an answer, <laughs> but I'm just kind of throwing out that, you know, it brings up with this team that's up here and, you know, and a lot of smart people in the room, how do we figure out, you know, really what is the cost of this in total um, and not just the saving side because we might find there's other ways to get costs out of the total system that net to the same place, you know, rather than just if we took prior offs away, insurance rates might go up because, you know, we're now paying for more, maybe, but maybe there's some offsets with, you know, eliminating groups and things like that. I mean, it's leap of faith, but. 
So, Dr. Ward, I just wanted to uh, follow up with you because we, we've heard uh, a possible solution from uh, Michael with a, a gold card type program. We've heard responses from the insurers, but the ACL really is a coalition of the willing, and for it to be willing, the providers really have to be excited about participating in your organization. And at the end of the day, um, the cost of your organization has to be less than, than the overall um, savings. So what is One Care specifically doing to try to create an environment where doctors um, don't have to um, seek prior authorizations as often? And have you had any success? Well, first, the, um, the fact is that we're not taking risk on pharmaceuticals. Um, so our participants, um, and you know, as a practicing family doctor as well, trying to keep track and interact with 40 different Medicare Part D formularies, the Medicaid formulary, the Blue Cross formulary, the MVP formulary, and all the different phone numbers that one must know to call those many, many um, entities. Um, that is, I, I think, as Josh has stated, is the the biggest burden and the most hassle is the, is the pharmaceutical. Um, and we don't have much leverage in that area because we're not taking on financial risk. So um, setting that aside, uh, I think you've, you've heard our, um, uh, our best efforts um, with uh, Medicaid to um, uh, try as best we can to inform our network about these, about these issues. Um, it's, as we've said, mentioned already, it's tough to socialize something that is, you know, a small percentage of your practice, um, to be able to have processes in place that, that everybody understands. Uh, I've already mentioned that um, the decapitated model of um, where you are at financial risk and <coughs> doing a procedure um, or ordering a device that um, is of questionable medical indication uh, will come back around to adversely affect the financial performance of the network. So um, I would also suggest that, that uncompensated care or uncompensated duties are another sort of thing that we are talking about here but haven't named it as such. The fact that the family doctor and their staff is being asked to do work and pay an hourly worker, let's say, to sit on the phone for 45 minutes to the benefit of, you know, for in the, on the commercial side, the employer who's seeking, you know, lower health care costs and to the insurer seeking less expenses to run the program, but it's, it's on the backs of uh, basically uncompensated care for people that are benefiting none financially from doing these tasks. Um, so um, we, we are trying as best we can. The other distinction here is we've been talking about administrative burden and I don't want to jump ahead to the, the, the fact that we are in a population health care model evolutionary phase. So that there are tasks in fact that the ACO is asking of primary care clinicians and specialists for that matter, that reflect trying to elevate the care of our patients within a more coordinated system, interacting in an organized way with community agencies, for example. And, and that has been, you know, people have complained about our, our requests uh, to use Care Navigator, for example, and that's, and that's considered a burden as well. So um, I think we have to make a distinction between um, administrative tasks versus tasks that are, uh, at least we're pay trying to pay for those tasks in terms of our complex care coordination program, for example, making payments so that those tasks are, are connected with a, a reimbursement for doing them. I think the problem is we're in an environment now where it's just another task. Yes. Yeah, provided us that this, this is a task. And no since we're and since we're the last ones in, it feels like <laughs> it, it feels like we're the straw that broke the camel's yeah. back. Mm -hmm. I comment on that a little bit. Um, you know, at, at one primary care advisory group meeting, I said, uh, said, okay, we're not, we don't seem to be getting anywhere. 
What if we just said, let's stop doing it as doctors? You know, I go around the state to all the hospital uh, organizations when they have their staff meetings and say, let's stop in 2021, let's just say we're done. And you guys figure out how we're gonna survive without them, without the prior offs. Um, which, and the response was, that'll never work because doctors won't do that to their patients. You're not gonna deny your patient care because it, for something you think is a waste of time, leading to moral injury, leading to career dissatisfaction, maybe leading them to have adverse outcomes or delays in care, um, you're not gonna do that to your patient. And so, you know, the theory was it wasn't gonna work. I think any solution that you come up with has to take that into account because we all wanna do, everybody here wants to do the right thing for the patient sitting in front of us, right? The patient sometimes doesn't know, they don't know really what the right thing is. So any solution has to have an education component about what to expect. I'll use an, an extreme example. Watch football on Sunday, guy goes down and gets his concussion. Oh, there he goes into the tunnel to get his MRI in five minutes. Johnny, on the football field, the high school football field, thinks he should get the same thing. Um, and, or, or, and then they go to the, the emergency room and they said, yeah, I got my CT scan which was completely not indicated if you go by appropriate use criteria, but they don't need to because it's an ER. And we pay for that. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I don't know if you can follow that, but we have to be all educating providers and the public about what's appropriate, if it's gonna work, so their expectations are met. Um, and they don't take everything solved by radiation or a medication or something. Um, anyway. I want to, if I could, just echo yes. echo that um, the statement about the emergency rooms. You know, there are clear criteria, for instance, for uh, when you need an X-ray of your of your sprained ankle. ERs never follow those. Those people get X-rays before the provider even sees them. They're they're at your X-ray on your way in the door. The, you, it is, you are hard pressed to get in and out of an emergency room without a, a CAT scan of your brain if you have a headache. It's very frustrating as a primary care doc to be judicious about use of technology and see your patients get wildly overtreated in emergency rooms. And boy, if you wanted to do something to help morale in primary care, start l asking for some adherence to, um, to guidelines uh, in emergency rooms. And, and sometimes the CTs are dangerous. There's, there's literature out there about uh, ra ionizing radiation of the brain leading to cancer later in life. It's theoretical, but it's out there. And we use that argument. That's why the Canadian CT rule works uh, for head injuries and things. So let me actually, one of the things I want to make sure that we hear about other issues besides prior ops and I want to move on to that, but I do want to say that I hope this isn't the last conversation that we have about this, and I think we've learned a bit here, and we'll have to figure out if there's steps that we can take, but I hope that there's steps that we take in here among some of the groups here and these continuing conversations will happen. So, but Dr. Holm. Okay. I'd love to hear from you. I know you have some other things that you want to Thank talk you. That, so. yeah. um, thanks. I'm Faye Holman. I'm a family doctor in Wells River, a small town over on the New Hampshire border, um, and have been in practice there for 25 years. Um, and I just wanted to spend some time about another aspect of administrative burden in our day, day practice, and that's quality measures. And um, I want specifically to talk about why when you're looking at quality measures, you may not really be looking at the data that, you're think, that you think you're looking at. And I'll give some examples about that. I know we have complained bitterly, uh, people in primary care, about quality measures over the last few years. And I, I'm afraid that it might be uh, sounding like we don't want to be measured or don't want to be looked at. And I assure you that um, family docs are very interested in their quality of the care they're providing and uh, especially when the data that they're looking at is accurate and shown to have clinical outcomes data. Um, and I have been asked um, at one of these meetings previously to come up with uh, some ideas for quality measures that I would find useful, and I actually will have an answer for that for you today. But I wanna give you three reasons why when you're looking at quality data you may not be uh, getting the right impression from them. You may be looking at erroneous or misleading data. The first is about the true costs of collecting the quality data. At my office, we have 7.7 .7 full-time equivalents, or 7.7 .7, uh, primary care providers, that's doctors and nurse practitioners. We have 6.6 .6 full-time equivalents of technical support. So almost a full-time person per provider who helps us with the IT, 
the informatics, which is actually the, e the electronic record itself, and medical scribes who input data day-to-day uh, -day with the patients. If you're looking, if you're hearing from people that quality measures are improving the cost of care, you have to ask some critical questions about what was included in that cost of care, whether that one-to-one -one ratio of support, technical support, to provider is really a, use, uh, a good use of our resources. I also want to mention that in that almost one-to-one -one, uh, ratio, I didn't include the time that our front desk and our nurses spend with prior auths and that the providers spend with the, uh, with the uh, quality data in the computer. So this is really just strictly technical support. A second uh, example I'd like to give about the data, the quality data that you're looking at being fraught come, um, comes from an experience of my own. I'm going to give you two examples, one of where data can look a whole lot worse than it really is and one of where data can look a whole lot better than it really is. And the one about it looking a whole lot worse comes from my own experience. When I, Last year I was given a, um, a printout from our informatics person saying that I had 90 patients who were overdue for colon cancer screening. I was really concerned about that. I think I'm pretty thorough and, um, and have long-term relationships with my patients, and I, I wanted to dig into that to see what I had been missing, why I would have 90 patients that were out of date. And I'll go through this quickly. Um, I'll just mention four of them were not my patients. They were just attributed wrong in the computer to me. Uh, 32 of them were greater than 75 years old, and you don't have to screen people over 75 for colon cancer, so they just shouldn't really have even been in the printout, but they were why they could get one, a list of people starting at age 50 but not cut it off at age 75, I don't know, but it, it wasn't done. Um, so that got me down to about 54 patients. 11 of them, when I actually looked one by one individually into the computer, um, had actually done uh, adequate screening with something called a FIT test. That's a little kit that you take home and, and give a, a supply a stool sample to your provider. Eleven of them had done it, and it had had, had a negative result, normal result. But because of some technicality about where it got logged into the computer, it has to be linked to a certain code. It has to be in a specific <laughs> box for someone doing informatics to find that data. So eleven of them were up to date with FIT, but couldn't be found in the computer. And four of them were up to date on their colonoscopy and couldn't be found in the computer. And again, with a colonoscopy, it's a little easier to understand. It's done off-site. It comes to you on a piece of paper, the colonoscopy report. Someone who touches that report, who scans it into the computer, has to remember to open up a whole new box in the computer and mark that the colonoscopy is up to date. Um, and that had missed, been missed on four of my patients. An additional four had a fit test at home. Just I'd seen them within the last month. They just hadn't turned it back in yet. An additional two had colonoscopies in progress. I had just seen them, and, and they just hadn't been for their colo yet. There were eight people who had declined screening, even after discussion of the risks. That's their right. There's not much we can do about that. Um, and so then I ended up, in the end, with 25 patients who were out of date. Two of them had been given a FIT test and hadn't returned it to us. That's something we could work on in our office to sort of follow up on the people who don't return them. Sixteen of them, this is kind of one of my key points, sixteen were overdue for their routine physical. That's when you de deal with things like getting people their colonoscopies. And that's another thing that we changed within my office to try to make sure people over 50 were at least showing up for a preventive care visit once a year and being a little more proactive about bringing them in. Three of them had come to their physical exam, their routine physical, with a very acute problem. Shortness of breath, muscle weakness, uh, someone with a, a leg wound that hadn't healed in five years, and it was the first time she'd come to see me about it. So there were, there were three of them who came with acute problems, and the, and the preventive care um, visit sort of got jettisoned. And that's a learning point for me. I should not try to do too much on that visit. Um, and that's a little hard for patients to understand. They would like to be able to come once with their list and get everything taken care of. But, so there were a couple of things there that I could do differently to capture. In the end, with all of those, minus this, minus that, there were three patients that I had seen for regular routine care and had forgotten to get them their fit test or recommend their colonoscopy. So three, and the report said 90 initially. The vast majority of those numbers had to do with informatics and data collection, not provider behavior. And I suspect that that would hold true for all different, all different providers. There's no reason to think that data isn't typical. 
So that's an example of quality data looking alarming and actually being not that bad. And the other example has to do with quality data that looks fantastic and actually might be a little bit alarming. Many of us in the electronic record era have resorted to using templates for our visits. These are pre-made uh, visits for diabetes, for instance, or congestive heart failure. Uh, so that the office note has everything pulled into it already when you start with the patient. And by that I mean uh, the physical exam is already in there, the review of systems, that's when you invite a patient to tell you anything that might be bothering them, shortness of breath, yes or no, chest pain, yes or no. And those templates have the patient's answers and the results of what you found on your physical exam already in there and plopped into the note before the patient walks into the room. That's how we sort of keep our heads above water in, in primary care, um, many of us. I, I actually don't use templates, but the vast majority of people do. The idea is that you're gonna go in afterwards and take out the things that you didn't ask and take out the things that you didn't examine on the patient. And human nature being what it is, when you're running behind and you're underwater, if your note looks done, you're probably going to move on to the next patient. There's a tremendous amount of inaccuracy with what's getting documented in patients' notes. And specifically about quality measures, one of the things we're graded on is whether we do a diabetic foot exam. In a diabetic foot exam, you are likely to record under the skin section of physical exam that the skin integrity is good, there's no breaks in the skin. You are likely to record under vascular that you can feel pulses, that there's circulation to the foot. And under neurologic, you're likely to record sensation, whether that patient has diabetic neuropathy or not. So all of those things are captured in your physical exam. But to get credit for it as a quality measure, you have to kick, tick a separate box that says diabetic foot exam. Yes, no. It has nothing to do with the quality of exam. It just puts in the date that you did it. It doesn't give you a right and a left foot. It doesn't even give you the choice if your diabetic happens to only have one foot. But you get quality measures for that box being ticked. Naturally, on the diabetic templates, that box is all in there ready for you. So if you're, if you're looking at data on a provider that says they've got 100% um, meeting the requirements for the quality measures. The first question, the, the first thing you might think is that must be a fabulous provider, fabulous physician, but the second question ought to be, where did that data come from? Was it real? There's a whole second conversation we could have about templated medical notes that talks about the cost to the system and it's separate from this quality issue. I would encourage you when you go to your provider next time to ask for a printed copy of your note and see what things they've documented, they've said and done, and you've told them in your note from that day. You'll be amazed. Um, but it allows upcoding and upbilling, and, and templated notes, I think, are not generally done for purely money and cynical reasons, but they certainly can be used that way. Uh, that's a conversation for another day. Um, but get your notes and look at them. You'd be interested. I can tell a story on the other day when we talk about this, about my daughter's $680 sore throat visit to an urgent care center. So in, I'll, just, I'll just wrap up. Uh, I know I'm taking a lot of time by saying that, when, that quality data is an enormous administrative burden to us in primary care, and it's of really, really um, questionable accuracy often. Please bear in mind the extra labor and cost to the practices that it takes and the decreased number of patients that we're able to see because we spend so much time on it. And when you really want to think about quality measures that don't require a lot of administrative burden but might be very effective in, in confirming that quality care has taken place, I think it's two questions. One, does, do you have a primary care provider with whom you have a relationship? And have you seen them for preventive care visit in the last year? I think that would go a long ways towards getting towards quality. So I'll stop now. I just do want to say that in our practice, we're the only practice for 30 miles that provides opiate, um, that pro provides a MAT program for opiate addicts. We're the only place you can get OB care for a 30 minute drive. We take new patients, insured, uninsured, whatever insurance you have. We take walk-ins, we do home visits, the whole shebang. In rural Vermont, we're an irreplaceable resource in our community, and 
I appreciate you being interested in our um, experience, and I hope you will continue to uh, seek and hear our voices. Thank you. Thank you. We certainly do want to hear your voice, and, and at least in my mind, that ratio that you described is is um, rather shocking. So. But I'm wondering if, if anybody else on the panel would like, yeah, yeah. Dr. Paris, respond um, to that, so I've been add to that. My powder yeah. dry for the last 90 minutes. Uh, <laughs> uh, I can vouch as a former uh, hospitalist at Dartmouth Hitchcock and in Windsor, I can vouch for Dr. Holman's care, taking care of her patients, uh, and, and the quality is 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 just fantastic. Um, just a clarification, despite wearing a suit. Um, uh, I'm, I'm still uh, practicing medicine. If you have the uh, misfortune of needing to be admitted uh, to the hospital Friday night at midnight in Windsor, I'll be the guy admitting you. Um, I uh, fled Boston 18 years ago where I was practicing primary care in one of the Beth Israel practices uh, because the, the environment, uh, the administrative burden was, was getting too high in Massachusetts. So I came to DH continued to practice, Dartmouth Hitchcock continued to practice primary care, mixed in a little bit more inpatient care. Um, and then uh, the administrative, like things often happen in New Hampshire and Vermont, the, the stresses of Southern New England worked its way up and, and I fled primary care and just became a hospitalist about 10 years ago. Um, I, found the, I found the work undoable, uh, to, to, be, to be honest. Um, now, straddling the world of administration and, and, and practice, um, I feel oftentimes that I am smothering innovative proje projects that some, that some of our clinic docs want to do because I know, the, I know about the added administrative burden that these projects uh, will entail. We have a fully comprehensive EMR in Cerner. I was part of the Go Live Big Bang team at, at Dartmouth Hitchcock when we went live with Epic. The CPRS team at the VA, which someone had already mentioned when I was in Boston as well, and helped to build an EMR um, at the Beth Israel, um, a homegrown EMR. And what's been touched on previously is that the, the early EMRs, which really were built for quality, safety, didn't have uh, the pressures of pursuing meaningful use dollars behind them. They uh, we're much more physician-centric um, and uh, I, I think easier to use, less, less onerous. But as, as meaningful use dollars came onto the table, larger uh, firms, larger platforms like Epic, like Cerner, um, and the myriad check boxes and checklists that you now have to work through came into play because hospitals and larger health systems became dependent on other non-operating revenue, which comes from, from meaningful use. Um, and once you get a fully comprehensive EMR, uh, it becomes that much more challenging to engage in something else. Uh, if it requires one of my doctors to log out of Cerner, log on to whatever it is, Care Navigator, Workbench One for those that are really wonkish, um, uh, the, the vital database, uh, any other non-system formulary, I just can't ask them to do that. And, you know, five years ago, I would have said, uh, well, you know what, I'll just hire you a scribe to work in this MR, uh, to work in this, with this EMR. Um, but what we've seen historically uh, is folks that had scribes also had some productivity incentives with it. We decided to go the other way. We got rid of all productivity incentives, pay our physicians a flat salary, but with that, I can't afford scribes. So it's the constant push-pull. And as we move into all three risk programs for 19, um, you know, I, the, the added risk of adding having a one-to-one -one ratio of support staff to physicians, uh, I, I just don't think we could uh, manage it. But being somewhat data-driven, uh, I'll share some of the but true da data and some off-the-cuff remarks. When Epic went live at, at Dartmouth Hitchcock, one of the Epic medical directors told me that they expect seven to ten percent of your medical staff uh, to retire uh, when we rolled out the EMR. That was a level of attrition, and we realized that. And these were folks that um, tend to be older, near retirement, but probably had a couple more years of good, solid medical practice or surgical practice, and it was actually more in the surgical realm. Uh, 
uh, where we lost urologists and a few other docs because of the EMR burden. So you lose 7 to 10 percent of your physician workforce. One of my colleagues at Dartmouth-Hitchcock, George Blyke, who exists in the quality and patient safety realm, uh, had a study published two years ago in the Annals of Internal Medicine where they followed 50 plus primary care physicians and also primary care um, or, or orthopedists that served them and cardiology that served the practices. And found that in the typical day, these physicians were spending about 27% of their total time on direct clinical care, 50% of their time on the H, uh, e, uh, EMR and the desk work. Um, I presume the other 13% was spent on the phone with IT, trying to get help, um, uh, and, and then, at least in my case, complaining about the, the, the EMR. Um, while in the exam room with patients, in the exam room, oftentimes with your laptop, another thing that I really struggled with was, you know, figuring how I was going to communicate, check boxes, and, and uh, fill in the uh, EMR. Uh, only about 53% of the time in the exam room uh, was spent on clinical FaceTime, and about only and 30%, 37% of that time was in EH, EHR in the room. And of the cohort of those 50 plus physicians that uh, kept after hours diaries of their work, it was at least another one to two hours of after hours work each night devoted to completing the record, getting the notes done, because people like me build policies around getting clinical documentation done. Um, and, and, and as been stated by the, the docs on the panel and providers on the panel, we care deeply about our patients. We want to do the right thing. So we're getting our notes done at 7, 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night. I don't think it's a uh, coincidence that the rise of EMRs and the rise of uh, of physician burnout rates um, are happening at the same time. Uh, I, when I query my my physicians at, at Montescutney Hospital and Woodstock, um, they say the same thing. So it shouldn't take 30 clicks to order a, a flu shot for a patient, but it does. And uh, uh, when I'm recruiting docs now, um, folks just out of training, finishing their family practice residency, finishing their internal medicine residency, they're not looking at, as soon as they find out I don't have scribes, they're not looking at our practice. And then I spend the rest of the interview saying, but it's a flat salary and, and uh, we don't have in incentives, uh, productivity incentives, and it's a great place to work and 30, 60 minute visits, but I'm constantly backtracking because they know and what they're hearing from their mentors is basically primary care is undoable. You need to have a scribe. You need to have tech support. You need to have this. Um, so to, to close, um, I, don't, I don't have answers for this. I think we can bite off small parts of the, uh, of the apple. I think one care will, um, and, and I'm a believer, and in full disclosure, I'm on the board of one care um, as well. Uh, I, I think it will help. Tremendously, I, I share concerns about scale targets um, and getting there. And um, as also as a um, being responsible for 400 plus employees, um, I understand that one care uh, needs to provide value uh, if we want to add to our uh, attributed lives and, and move uh, self-insured programs over. We need to make sure that we provide value. Um, if I ran a for-profit. Uh, a company with 400 employees, I would, you know, I would probably be looking at, well, what's your prior auth process? And because that's cost saving, and that's going to be a real challenge. It's going to be a uh, a tight rope as we as we move forward. Um, but I think uh, I think there's there's hope, <laughs> and I try to give that message to our our our, our primary care providers. Um, you know, I'm transitioning back into some primary care and doing. Uh, some MAT work locally, um, so I, I, I think we can get there, but it's uh, it's going to take some work. Dr. Ward, do you want to actually attribute any more to that since one care has just come up and is, is part of the mechanism by which we're collecting quality measures and, um, you know, Care Navigator has come up, as you mentioned earlier, and part of this EMR um, struggle. And I, the way I think about it is EMR, um, to some extent, 
you know, EMRs are evolving, and I think that they were not always designed with the user in mind. I think we hear that a lot, and I think that my hope is that EMRs are going to evolve and become more user friendly. But in that transition and in that process, we're seeing the stress and the you know, the emotional cost and the time cost for providers to be working through these systems. And are, is there a way out of this? You know, how are we, what does it look like in two years and three years in terms of that time, the scribes, the need for scribes? Is technology going to help us out of this? I would, I would just say that Robin uh, and I had a, a teacher at, at the Dartmouth Master's program who was sort of in Washington in the early days of EMR and you know the, the failure of interoperability requirements on the part of the vendors of the builders of the EMRs. I mean it's basically just a, an ignoring of regulations that would have required us to have a much more sensible system. So uh, I agree with Faye that um, the um, uh, finding the data in a way that's economical enough to go and get the data is really, really important. Um, and uh, in terms of the quality measures, um, likewise, we've tried to uh, emphasize quality measures that are based on medical claims as much as possible to try to avoid the burden of literally going into the chart and having humans harvest the number out of some box. So um, it's, not, it's not perfect. It's often process uh, related rather than outcome related. Um, it looks at, you know, we have stakeholder groups who want to be sure that they have a quality measure that somewhat reflects uh, the spirit of, of their um, uh, topic. Um, it's hard to argue with, did you screen for smoking? Did you? have well-controlled diabetics, and I uh, basically agree that those are kind of the, the bread and butter, the foundational elements of let's try to measure how effective the system is. But we need to get a lot more sophisticated um, in, in our data collection. And then it, it's also important to say that, that using the claims data, we try to build um, reports, for example, around use of post-acute care services so that we can see whether one community uses a lot more skilled nursing facility after a typical Medicare admission compared to another community or a surgical procedure. Uh, to me, that's the kind of uh, quality measure, or I'll say in a different way, it's pointing out variation that, and I don't know, we all don't know where the right answer is. There is a difference who's right and who might be wrong, or is there, in fact, let's at least try to standardize and understand why one community seems to be doing a lot more of X compared to another community. So, I'll stop there. Yeah, Dr. Lillian. Yeah, I'd like to, to speak to your point, because I think you're know, listening to, and I agree with everything that's been said, and, and Dr. Holman, I, I don't know you personally, but boy, I, there's, um, I can tell hearing you speak, you, you clearly have a presence with your patients. I want to come be your patient. <laughs> <laughs> it's good, sorry. Um, we can I, all go for colonoscopy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah I better, yeah, better be ready. Um, but, and I don't think we maybe have, a, in terms of educating our physicians and training around how to interact with the EHR, and my, my point is moving towards they expect nothing less than to interact with the EHR we've probably missed out on creating some of the empathetic skills that I think you clearly have. Um, so that's a topic for a discussion. But I, I agree strongly that um, the uh, technology in the medical field has lagged under technology substantially. And I think we've moved through a very uncomfortable period of trying to do something with what is uh, inadequate technological infrastructure. And so while that makes most of us want to go back to our days where you know um, I was certainly not in digital data and how I was trained. I was trained in a very analog system and not that long ago, of course. Um, when you think about the amount of data we are managing for at, at particularly our sickest patients, there is nobody in any other 
uh, any other industry that would manage all that data that's so highly individualized without some sort of pretty robust and mature data system. And that's what we've been trying to do is why it's so stressful. Now the, pro the, the, the horizon that I see that gives us hope is that we have a lot of technologies, Epic in particular is the one I know best is which we use, but they have invested over the last couple years, they understand, and this is a little bit, it will be like show me the money and I'll believe it, but at the same time I'm starting to see it where they are investing significantly in the user experience. Um, and we also, uh, we, there are, are some really robust data that shows in addition to having that technology, the other things that um, really improve provider satisfaction with that, the operational systems you set up around it, and the training that you provide around it, there are really good data around um, uh, physician satisfaction, provider satisfaction, and the kind of training you invest in those providers to use those systems. The, the, so I see a lot of hope on the horizon, and I would never want to work in a situation where I was in a completely analog system anymore. I'd want, but I wouldn't want uh, an EHR, I'd want a really, really good EHR, so I totally agree with some of that sentiment. The challenge, and I could rip you go, I'll, I'll speak only for myself, but I think that really great EHR experience is very expensive. It takes a lot of investment, just not just in money, but also in time, and it's longitudinal. It's not something you can pop off like a tent. It takes years to, to get to the maturity of, uh, of a journey. And we're on a journey still. I think we have a lot of, um, I'll give an example in a moment, but we have a long way to go to improve it. Uh, but one of the examples is Dragon. Uh, Dragon is a, is a dictation software. It's that you, it types while you talk kind of thing. Um, Dragon is terrible. You have to train it. It doesn't. It, it, it has crazy mistakes, um, and so very few people use it. Well, within the last year or so, we've adopted a technology called Dragon Medical One, which is the new version of Dragon. It is so much better than Dragon. It is. Um, it knows jargon, medical jargon. I can put in orders with Dragon Medical One. It's like a virtual scribe, and there is. It is a little bit so in the room. And I have to navigate this page. I say, look, you know, forgive me, I'm going to talk about my advice, but I want you to listen. I say, I had a great visit with Mrs. Jones today. I want to make sure she takes this medicine. You're going to eat this kind of food, and I can see you in two months. And it all goes on the screen, and I give her a copy, and I say, does that sound right to you? And she goes, well, I told you something different. Oh, okay, then we fix it. All happens in the room, I put in orders. Um, and my wife's in private practice. She said, I would love that. And she, that's not something that at the scale that she practices in, that she can invest in having in her office. So I think this is the kind of challenge we're facing with technology. We have to practice with technology, but it's expensive and there's a big spectrum of the quality of, of technology. Michael, did you want to? Oh, go ahead, Rick. Um, I was going to. I have a couple comments. First of all, I appreciate Dr. Holman's comments. I, um, I was the quality director for Health First before I became the whatever my title is now, like network director or something. Um, and so I did a lot of work with, the quality, with picking quality, um, what the quality measures were with all these panels that we did in Montpelier and trying to figure out. Um, and anything that is discrete, like Norm said, if I can, if you can pull the human globe in A1C to stuff a lab result and doesn't require me to check another box for it, that's great. If we can reduce those, that, that's fantastic. I do feel the same thing that I've said for several years now is that when we see improving quality measures, I think we're seeing improved um, box clicking and documentation and not necessarily actual improvement in quality of care for a lot of these things. Um, but there are some definite benefits. Hemoglobin A1C and diabetics, I think, are the, you know, they're kind of the low hanging fruit. They're, they're easy to, to, uh, to get. They're easy to act on, and there's definite clinical, you know, uh, outcome improvement with them. So, you know, there's some like that. There are others like you know having a BMI of under 25, which is what you know what what's you get to counsel if they're above 25. Now, I'll have to guess that probably 85 percent of my patients have a BMI of over 25, somewhere 25.1, and I'm actually documenting there, discuss diet and exercise, health habits with the patient for his BMI of 25.1, which is about this big around. Um, so that's a little frustrating. I think for the for the documentation of the temples here, one of the things we hear about all this documentation, we're doing it for insurance and for reimbursement. I mean, most of our notes are, most of the things we're putting in there now are not really being used clinically with anyone after us. And when I look at my notes, I look at the assessment plan, I look at my schedule. So, you know, there is four pages before that that no one ever looks at except when the insurance company audits them, um, as, for, as far as I know. Um, so a lot of those template-driven notes are driven by that whole process. And I, 
if I'm not mistaken, I think Medicare is looking at getting rid of the levels of, of office visits and going with just straight, you know, sort of straight fee funding. I don't know if that's something that is feasible, if that makes sense, but reducing some of that need to put in lots and lots and lots of verbiage, um, just as they can put in to get a, to get a, to be able to justify the time we spent with the patient to document. I don't think people are using templates, like Dr. Holman said, maliciously. I don't think it's, oh, I'm putting all this information there so I can code higher. I think we're spending the, the amount of time we should for our patient the billing appropriately, and then we're putting this added burden of documentation on top of that to justify the payment for the service that I think we're, um, that we're providing. I think the other thing with the EHR, so I, I um, have a lovely relationship with scribes. I love the idea of a scribe. I love the idea of walking in, talking to my patient, walking out, and having the note done, the med sent and done. Um, I don't want to sit in a, room, in a room with Mrs. Jones telling me about her mother dying and have someone in the corner typing. And I'm just not willing to sacrifice that. So our practice doesn't use scribes. Um, and I don't know if that's sustainable. I think that's a sad position to be in where I feel like I have to put a third person in the room just to do the work because I can't do it myself. That's not why I went into medicine. And I think one of the problems with the, e, with the robustness of the EH, EHR, as Jim says, as they grow, as you bring out a new provider, you know, you're very well versed in in that and you're very well versed in that because we've grown with these systems. But you bring out a new provider, and it's a whole new system. And there's just so they're so complicated and so nuanced that you can't possibly train someone for every little piece of it. And so I I fear that as turnover starts happening, that's going to become an even more costly and, and incomplete process. That's my comments on the various things. And Michael, you were going to comment as well. Sure, just really briefly, uh, just. Medicaid's going to take really seriously board member Holmes' question of, hey, what's different a year from now? And so we're really happy to work with anybody who has ideas, specific ideas to try to incrementally reduce provider burden over the next year. Um, just three other really quick things. Uh, I'm really confident that we as a payer can hedge the financial risk of ending prior authorization. We can do that. That's not hard. But I would say we would still need a way to ensure appropriate utilization and that's one of those things that in an integrated health system, we're not comfortable doing on our own. We want to work with other folks about what that term means, because we don't know yet. Um, and then also, when we go to the legislature, because the taxpayers fund our health plan, if we're going to guarantee payment for capitation, there is a natural inclination to ask for more access and quality measures. So I think all of us have to take seriously the question of what is success? Because right now, it's show me your access and quality measures, and I get how that's not what providers want. And then last, I have the, one of my other hats is to be the executive sponsor of the state's HIT efforts. So health information exchange and vital. And that's been a heck of a challenge. But we, um, we tried to build the report that's going to come out in November about the state's HIT direction on use cases. So what do people need the technology for? And a big moment for me was we're having a dialogue about we could have technology do this. We could have technology do that. And a provider said, I just, you know what I want out of technology? I want to be able to make eye contact with my patient. That's what I want out of technology. And so we're trying really hard to think, how do we make HIT policy investments people focused rather than technology focused? Because it's been technology focused for many years and many millions of dollars and we do not have a lot to show for it. So we're trying really hard to make it more people focused. Anybody from the panel want to add anything to the conversation around either of those topics of EHR, burden, or quality measures? Anything that hasn't been said before I open it up for questions over here? I think I just, at the last primary care advisory group meeting, I think we presented to the board, and uh, I think I said that exact same thing. Whatever you do as you go forward, whatever you can do to get us in front of our patients, face to face and spend more time doing that, please do that. Is that the limit test of, uh, of whatever you decide. So I echo that strongly. I really think about it in terms of the data about texting while driving, that you, your brain absolutely can't pay attention to the road and your phone at the same time, and that's how I feel with my computer. Every time I have to move the cursor, open a box, check a whatever, search for a document, I'm breaking breaking contact with my patient, I'm not listening, and, and I'm not making eye contact. Yeah. Um, we haven't yet mentioned patient-entered data. Um, you know, we're talking about clinician burden. Um, certainly the creation of systems where the patient 
has arguably the most vested interest in a high quality outcome. And uh, us growing tools that will allow uh, patients to not only enter in clinical information as far as history and, and symptoms and complaints, but also to feed back, frankly, on patient reported outcomes. Uh, I, I've been really impressed with the opportunity of, um, you know, there, uh, the outcome for any given individual uh, reflects how the treatment may or may not have been appropriately matched to their value system. And um, so somebody whose values dictated maybe a less invasive procedure but ended up with a more invasive procedure might be pretty unhappy and vice versa. So I think that uh, as we move forward in trying to understand what quality measurement in healthcare means, I think the, the customer, the patient, probably needs to be much more included in um, contributing to our understanding of their satisfaction with our system. So actually, Michael, let me ask you the question, is that part of the conversation around the HIT plan, is focusing more attention on patient-entered data? Is that part of that? Yeah, I think that's going to be part of what we talk about going forward. I think, um, just to talk about it for one second, one of the things that we think is not wrong with health information exchange and technology in Vermont is the state's not been very clear about what its goals are. So we're focused on what we want, whether uh, who can deliver it, our providers better off, and that our providers better off. And so we're certainly having a discussion about, okay, what is the right way to get data in? And it's not just a presumption that it's an EHR, a doctor entered the EHR, or a practitioner entered the EHR into the patient. Um, and then also just talking about what, one of my big worries about health information technology in Vermont is I do think we're doing a good job cleaning up the program, um, but we might be cleaning it up for the world that existed in 2009 instead of 2019. So we're asking ourselves questions about what do patient registries look like? What are you know, condition-specific resources? How do text messages fit in all this? And so we're at the beginning of that conversation, but trying to be really careful about what could we go down. We do not want to go down the wrong road um, during HIT's extended technological adolescence. <laughs> <laughs> And any board members want to ask any questions about that topic? EHR, quality, no? Nope. Okay. Are there any, and I want to be able to open this up to public comments and all of that as well, but are there other areas that we haven't touched on? I, I think um, we touched a little bit on provider burnout, physician burnout, and the, the role that administrative burden plays there, I think, as Data, ever increasing data around EMRs, EHRs, admin burnout, uh, admin contributing to burnout. Um, I always refer back to an IHI paper uh, published not too long ago, and encourage our individual practices to and providers to ask what what matters most to us um, as we practice. Uh, what are the unique impediments within our practice? Um, I think of, I'm not sure. I think it may have been a Dostoevsky quote. Uh, you know, all unhappy, all, all happy families are the same. All unhappy families are unique uh, in their own way, or unhappy in their own ways. Um, there can be un unique impediments in each of our practices, um, and if we can commit to a systems approach, and I think almost most most importantly, especially in small rural practices tap into system resources or other regional resources around improvement science. I know that folks like Norm and, and, and Robin have, have uh, gone through either CECS or TDI, that's the Dartmouth Institute. I think primary care practices are ripe for green belt and black belt projects to improve process workflow. If you, if you do some um, mapping of what a patient does and the touches of all the members of your practices on that patient before they get to you as a provider and after they leave you as a provider, there's a lot of room for um, improvement. Um, that can be hard. I know if you're practicing in, in, in Wells River, um, it, it, it may be challenging to reach out to the Value Institute, but you know what? There are tuck interns out there that will be happy to come up and look at your practices and do internship work and not cost a penny. Um, and I know that I'm always happy to help direct folks to, to rural practices so that they can take a look at it. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. Burnout, we, we've, we've, got to, we've got to com uh, combat burnout and looking at each individual practice is a way to do it. Other 
some thoughts from any other panel, something that we just didn't touch upon, some question we didn't ask. We did talk about facilitating communication between PCP practices and right. other practices, and I know that's a, that's a huge um, time sucker in terms of the day, um, both from um, everything from putting time into notes and lab things that was special that they never get a chance to review because of, of miscommunication or poor workflows on either side, um, to getting notes back that aren't as helpful either from the ED or from a specialist that don't really address the issue that was there, duplicate labs being drawn, multiple visits because patients didn't get their questions answered the first time. Um, there's a lot of documentation and communication issues between these and specialists. Right. Dr. Luger, can you talk a little bit to that because I understand some of that relates to PRISM and some of that relates to, so I, you know, you're that you can yeah, is there so, a workable solution to that? Yeah, this, so it's yeah, it's a it's a big. <laughs> We're, worked on. We're working together. We, we have, um, and it is it is something we absolutely need to address. Even internally, I will say, within the University of Rock Medical Center, there are three or four different ways for me to get specialty notes back, and the my least favorite way is to get them all three ways, um, <laughs> because then you get different ways. And I can imagine I have a vision for a very mature system where. Um, the actionable things go in one file, and the FYIs go in another, and um, wouldn't that be nice, right? That would be fantastic. And that's, internal, and that's a big, you know, we're working on that, and then we have to work on externally where we're, um, we're working with our colleagues who have different technology platforms. And I think how we solve that challenge is important. One of the things that when we went around and asked people, one of the challenges, particularly around access and information flow, and, and we we're, were asking specifically about access, they were saying, gosh, you know, Okay, so it takes two or three months to see specialist X, but the bigger gripe was actually how long it takes just to have the appointment assigned. And, um, you know, that it's been a week and we still don't know what the appointment is. And I actually, I share that concern. And so we, we looked at um, how, what that, the, the uh, referral lag, we call that. We looked at the referral lag. And um, it's, a lot, it's, it's a little over 11 days on average. Some places it's doing really well, and some places um, uh, are doing uh, worse than that, which is, which is really not acceptable. And, but, and one of the ways we spent the last couple months figuring out, even within Epic, um, until we have full Epic, this is getting a little in the nuance, so you know, um, forgive me, but it's important that we were not using the EPIC tech, uh, scheduling technology to its fullest extent. So starting next week, actually, we have a go-live date, but we're setting a standard of three days to get back to the referring clinic about this is when the schedule is. So we want to be, we want Rick to be able to communicate to his patient, if you do not hear within three days, then you call next, right? That's, we want that standard, and we want to, I don't, we're not going to be able to meet that standard right away across the board, but we'll be able to measure it, um, and then be able to work towards the standard. One of the um, one of the challenges in meeting that is in some of the uh, specialties where we have um, the number one the poorest access, and number two the most subspecialties. Neurology, for this example, we've talked about that in this room before. Where um, and because they're doing a lot of provider review before the physician sees the patient, um, but before it's even scheduled, um, because they're looking at well, this is somebody I need to see sooner. I'm working with those docs to create. Um, to create templates, can you can a nurse review, can uh, an APP review? How how do we expedite this? Because we we don't want to put up that barrier. At the same time, they're trying to steward their precious resource, which is understandable. Um, so that's so one thing that we're putting in right away next week. And the more um, so I expect to hear from you if this. I, I, I will let you know. You know. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I'll and, and I'll leave for that matter. But the um, so hopefully we'll see movement. Um, the other piece that we that that's going to be about I think a three year journey is to have a patient access center. We have a patient access center right now. It's um, not universally used uh, by all of our specialists. Um, but what were the vision for? So it's a very underdeveloped. I won't even go into describing what it does because what it could do is much greater. So what we're looking is a single point of access where we would take the scheduling. So to create a universal experience for our referring providers for all our specialties, we have to take that experience out of each of our specialty clinics and put it in one place so we can standardize the experience for everybody. And so our goal is to take the scheduling away from the cardiologist clinic, the surgical clinic, the et cetera, and put it all in one patient access center that can A, schedule an appointment right there on the phone, 
and then B, say, hey, all right, here's the date and time that um, based on our internal criteria, um, oh, there looks like there's an x-ray we need that we don't have. And working with a lot of our community providers, they say, look, I'd be happy to navigate, particularly when it's things within the primary care realm. We don't want to ask primary care providers to order things where they're not comfortable interpreting, which is another um, conversation I'm having with our specialists. So the idea of that patient access center would make it clear, like, this is the one place you go. The, the challenge, because I, as a primary care provider, I'm, I'm, I am selfishly in many ways very concerned about primary care provider burnout. I'm also, though, worried about our specialty care provider's experience, because we need to keep them here and engaged and um, for, for all the access reasons that we all know about. So as, as much as I went, whether you're employed by the medical center or not, I want you to be able to enter a referral to see one of our specialty surgeons, and then you come back away and assume it's going to be done. I also want our specialists to say, oh gosh, all right, here I'm seeing this person with problem X. This is something that's within my wheelhouse, this, and I have all the information I need. I want them to go in with, uh, because ultimately, those two ends of things will influence the patient's experience. So that means taking the scheduling function out of that specialist's office, that's a big step. That's something that they have a lot of anxiety about for a lot of good reasons. Um, and so we have to meet those challenges with them to make sure that we're not, because if all of a sudden their day is, you know, oh, I, I had 15 minutes to talk about a patient getting a very complex surgery, you know, et cetera, they're gonna be, that's gonna create a lot of dissatisfaction on that end. So it's, it's a complex journey, we have to take it. I will say this is not something that we have, um, that starting that three-day referral live standard is the beginning of this longer journey. Um, we have allocated, it's on a strategic plan, we have allocated resources to it, so it's, it's, it's a goal we want to meet. Um, I, I, it's much more comfortable to talk about something we're about to do, like the thing that's going on live next week, than our grant plans for the next three years, because I want to be able to come back in one year, two years, three years, and be able to demonstrate that progress. But nevertheless, we have that vision, and it really should, it's, it really should be clean for both ends of that support system. So I don't know if that gets to some of your point, but um, we're also in, um, we're in uh, one month having a workshop for a single referral form. Um, and that'll be interesting because the you know, forms have been a big uh, concern. We're really moving towards a system of zero referral forms. Um, but uh, you know, if you give us the name, the demographic, the chief complaint, insurance information, we should be able to give you an appointment and we'll collect other data after that. But there are still some people with analog processes, or even digital processes that just want to know and have some of that basic information. So we have a really interesting workshop coming up for that that we have some community partners coming in for. So I think a lot of good energy on this and happy to work with you know anyone from the community. So I guess I want to open it up for public comment or any other board commentary or questions. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, around the quality measurement, because I think this is an area where it, at least the state partners have tried very hard to try and align quality measures to the extent that, again, you know, the state is not in control of the federal government or the, you know, a lot of the federal requirements. So. I don't know how much that actually gets felt at the provider level, but I do think that's an area that we as a board and um, have, have been as mindful as we, we can be on the state level around, for example, making sure in the all-payer model the quality measures were not new, they weren't, um, do, you know, something that wasn't already being collected, and again, to the norms point earlier, were as claims-based as possible so that uh, it, you're not, don't have to have someone to manually collect those. So I just wanted to make that point because I do, you know, again, I don't know how that is felt at the provider level, but I think there has been a lot of efforts to, um, to try and do that to the extent possible at the state level. Um, I, anybody else? No? Okay. I guess, you know, again, I, I think I hope that we're, we do meet again in a year from now and there is some progress. I think I just jotted down a couple of notes that I'm optimistic about, and I think we didn't, you know, you never solve all problems in a two-hour public meeting, but I'm optimistic about the improved referral scheduling process and some of the work that you're doing there. I'm, I'm optimistic that our carriers are going to think about some of this gold card. I mean, I know there was no commitments on your part, but there sounds like there's some move forwards and starting to think about how do we streamline some of this prior authorization work there and really uh, focus on the high utilizers. And 
and perhaps think more about that. So I'm optimistic that maybe some work will be done there. I'm optimistic about Diva and Diva's, you know, experiment with waiving uh, prior offs and looking at some of the data and then their partnership with OneCare as well. Um, and getting achieving more scale and getting more providers into one care and thinking about how we might be able to reduce administrative burden as we achieve more scale and one care has is moving some of that risk from payers to providers there's less need for some of that utilization um, oversight from the payer side I'm optimistic about um, Dr. Paris, you, you mentioned some of this, uh, you know, there are resources out there for practice efficiency. Maybe that can be tapped into um, thinking about uh, how to, you know, maybe some of this addiction, you know, technology that's available, some of the EMR is evolving, and maybe there's ways to lean processes in, in practice transformation. Um, thinking about that. So I'm optimistic. I hope that these, can, these conversations can continue and, and you know, as we're doing the work of the board, this will be in the back of our mind. Is, is what we're doing adding to administrative burden of our providers? And what are ways in which we can, uh, as a state and as, you know, healthcare regulators, think about reducing administrative burden? I want to open it up to, to public comment. And actually, maybe I will turn it over to Kevin at this point and just, you know, open it up to public comment on this topic here. Sure. Kit? Uh, thank you. Um, I think that uh, this is another robust conversation and uh, really appreciate uh, the board, in particular uh, Jessica Holmes, for being so optimistic because for some people who have worked on this topic, um, there's reason to have some skepticism. And uh, I used to be attacked for being a cockeyed optimist, so. Uh, Please uh, consider that with some of the comments I've been made. One is since 2011, when the Green Mountain Care Board started, uh, this is the second go round of a really focused discussion about prior authorization. Um, and I think it's unfortunate that the board, during the first conversation, didn't take more tangible steps. Frankly, there was no better opponent particular opponent, better educated than I am on the subject, than Alan Ramsey, who was a board member, who spent a year and a half uh, lobbying the board and others to take some tangible steps. And um, I think that's unfortunate. Uh, it doesn't in any way reduce the importance of the conversation, because healthcare is complicated. But it's so complicated that sometimes you do nothing and you get paralyzed. So that's, that's a conversation to a large extent. Prior authorization, in my opinion, is not a value added proponent of our healthcare system. And um, so I don't want to mince words. I think it's done more harm than good. And uh, my orientation is more as a mental health advocate for many years. So it probably goes back to about 1985 that I first started seeing the misuse and the cost of, of uh, prior authorization, not totally from the perspective of the practitioner, but from the person who's missing from the table here. There's an imaginary chair over here, and it's called the consumer, the patient, who doesn't know any of this. But I can tell you that based on my experience of about 20 years, and I think we really made over 20 years in the legislature some really tangible steps in the mental health field when it came to the negative aspects of prior authorization. But I will tell the board that I would be happy to give you more detail that prior authorization has often simply been used as a barrier to accessing treatment and put it out there and say it. Uh, that's one of the mechanisms that prior authorization does serve. It also has what I'll call, and I'm being very nice and kind, a very subtle way of influencing clinical decisions that often aren't in the best interest of the consumer who's sitting in that imaginary chair. The consumer doesn't know it, but for a lot of reasons, the practitioner doesn't want to go in a certain direction because prior authorization is such a hassle that it's not worth going in that direction. And I can also tell you, and again, this is skewed a little bit from the mental health field, but I have a feeling I, I, it, it encompasses all of prior authorization systems. It's also an imperfect system. I'm glad that people are interested in the cost of, of prior authorization. 
because I'm aware of, of over many decades, actually, where the folks who were actually doing the, the prior authorization checking were either uh, poorly trained or influenced, frankly, more by the financial aspect of whether we approve a certain treatment or not. So I just wanted to add that because it hasn't really been mentioned maybe as bluntly as that. It doesn't mean it's all bad, but that's part of what we're talking about when we talk about prior authorization. So, you know, one of the concerns that I have is that this conversation, which is very robust and everybody really <laughs> is working to try to address these issues, I'll call this the conversation of the phenomenon in Vermont of snow in April. You know, you get that incredible heavy downpour of snow April 2nd, and it's almost, some, for some people it's exciting, for some people it's terribly depressing. But to a large extent, it just evaporates. And that's really been what's the history of conversation about prior authorization. People sort of dig in, really try to understand and come up with ideas. Nobody's really seriously going to do anything of major consequence, but it's going to evaporate. And so to the board, and particularly to Jessica Holmes, who, who you know, was so optimistic, be a little less optimistic, and a little more cynical, and we may get somewhere. That's my commentary back. I do have, however, um, you know, uh, just a few more comments, and then I would all call a proposal. I know I've sort of been spinning out some proposals lately, but it's better to have tangible things to react to than just this vague idea of maybe it'll be better in a year. So one of the reasons that it's been very difficult to, to move this issue, and, you know, it, it's not really... Uh, something that comes up that often here is really what I put in the box of the politics of healthcare. And the politics of healthcare really means that the insurance industry, particularly Blue Cross Blue Shield, is incredibly powerful, and they're incredibly powerful over at the state house. And a large extent, the reason there hasn't been either legislation or movement, there has been some very good legislation and movement in the mental health area, but in general, it's because of the power of that industry. And uh, they will not, or, or historically, they have not been willing to support really any major change in prior authorization. They'd be around the edges. And I can, I can tell you right now, as a person who's spent 30 years sort of around the state house, that primary care physicians and psychiatrists are much less powerful and have much less knowledge of how to work the system over the state house. So, it's, a to you know, it's totally predictable that a piece of legislation would not get through. You know, if you'd hired me as a consultant for $1,000 a day, I would have waited seven days to tell you. It's not going to pass, don't you know? So to get to the point that I want to make is um, I would propose to the Green Mountain Care Board that it consider sort of the following notion as it thinks about prior authorization. There are other important topics that came up be during the secondary part of the conversation. But one would be to reduce the use of prior authorization by 80% in one, in, in over, over a one year period in Vermont's healthcare system. Somebody's got to do it. It's not going to happen in the legislature, I can, I can predict. Um, and the Green Mountain Care Board would have to go out on the limb a little bit to do that, but it would be a very interesting experiment to say there's enough room where some of the arguments that have been made that are really worthy, there are certain areas where prior authorization really can play a role, but the goal is, just as we have like in the energy field, we have a goal, after one year, we're going to reduce prior authorization. And I, I would say we should call it the uh, Alan Ramsey Act because he would be very uh, worthy of, of that uh, proposal. And the second part would be to ref change the system that we have now and, and make it more of a system where if you think about prior authorization, what you're really trying to do is identify what I'll call outliers. It should be an outlier system. It shouldn't be across the board. It should, you know, it, it, you know. So, you want to 
kind of have a system. It's not that complicated with all the money we put into computers and all the brains we have to create a, a, a system that says we want to look at the outliers. But I want to you know, also say that being an outlier isn't totally all bad. Uh, there are some people who may be, frankly, following a, you know, a, a, a regime that most of the medical field won't agree with. There are also some physicians who may push for certain interventions that may be worthy of trying. And, and, and I think that would create a more robust conversation about the quality of, of, and the use of, of prior authorization. So um, I hope it's not snow in April. Um, this conversation goes back in the legislature 30 or 35 years. It really hasn't matured all that much, in my opinion. And uh, we now have, you know, we have a board that's empowered to help set and chart some directions. And so, incredibly worthy conversation, very complicated, like everything else in healthcare. But if you set a standard where you say 80% reduction in prior authorization from what we have now, keep the 20%. Refine that so it really captures those areas where it's absolutely either needed or this value added. So the end line is I'd love to hear the board make a statement. I, I'd, be, I'd be happy to draft it if you'd like it, to, or what I'd like the board to say. And say, in the big picture, um, prior authorization is not a value added in the state of Vermont for consumers and for our health care system. So that's my comment. Thank you, Ken. I was beginning to worry that it was going to snow before you got your proposal out. <laughs> As you know, I think uh, I was in the trenches with you on a few of those attempts at trying to pass legislation to uh, restrict the use of prior authorizations. And I always felt that uh, there was a powerful group that was working against any change. And here we are. 10 years later, and we still haven't seen the change. We saw the, the little pilot project, um, but that was about it. Other public questions or comments? If not, is there any old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? May I just say one thing, actually? Absolutely. I actually just want to thank everybody for, I know all of you took a lot of time out of your day, and it was very informative and helpful for me, and I, I imagine for many of us in the room, and I just really want to be, you know, cognizant of your time, the value of your time, and appreciative of, of you spending some time sharing your wisdom with us. And I don't think this will be the end of the conversation. I just wanted to, I, I saw Lee Bryan in the audience from BPQHC, and I neglected to say that you know, part of our primary care and comprehensive payment reform model is to try to get uh, some services within primary care to you know, open, open under the hood and make sure that things are as efficient as possible uh, to try to make the process uh, as smooth as possible. So thank you and thank you, Jess, for putting together this uh, excellent panel. Um, I think we've learned a lot. <laughs> Progress is yet to uh, be seen, but I think that uh, some key players are at the table, and we uh, will continue to have this discussion moving forward. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone.